Well, filter free America is where I wanna be. Riving on the shiny black shores of oil soap Lady Liberty. With justice, not just blind, but death coming unkind. Thank God I'm filter free. Yeah. It's filter free America. Motherfucker. <laughs> Hello, 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 Filter Free America listeners. Welcome back to the Filter Free America podcast. First things first, and I feel like I do this a lot, and I guess I do, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, uh, apologies go out for my ex- substantial delay in uh, getting new episodes to you. Uh, I'll, it's not my fault this time. There was an update on the Mac OS something or other, and it fucked up my whole uh, editing software, and I'm just now getting it back to where it's working again. So, valid excuse. My apologies. Uh, I'll try not to let it happen again. I don't know. Things are weird with the uh, with the Apple computers. I don't know, but we're back. Hey, let's talk about the guest real fast because this is a longer episode. And I want to hurry up and get into it. Uh, so much so, I'm not even going to do an outro on this episode. When we get done, when the conversation is done, the episode will be over. So you don't have to listen for me to say anything fucking halfway witty at the end of this podcast. You can just turn it off, as you probably do uh, the rest of the times. But I digress. Uh, the the guest for this episode is uh, comedian Darren. Chase. He is originally from the uh, state of Minnesota, uh, but he's now a regular uh, in the Las Vegas and L.A. Uh, comedy scenes. Uh, we talk about a lot of stuff, uh, mostly conspiracy stuff, but uh, it doesn't start out that way. Uh, the first uh, 10, 13 minutes, I think, uh, he tells me about this crazy intestinal condition that he was, is, was, is still recovering from. Uh, apparently something went on, went wrong with his guts. Uh, and, uh, he basically was, uh, not, maybe not almost dying, but could have died if it if left untreated, but it got pretty serious. And he talks about that and how it affected, uh, you know, his, um, ongoing comedy career. Uh, but then from there, it really takes a, a sharp right turn and we get deep into some conspiracy talk and warning Warning, warning, warning. He gives me his arguments on why he thinks flat earth or the flat earthers, I guess, or the idea of flat earth might be right. Okay. He's not, as I understand his position, he's not like a hundred percent on it, but he considers the idea, whatever. I don't know. Listen to the podcast. Well, I don't know why I'm trying to explain it here. Um, uh, so we talk a lot about that idea. Uh, while I'm not sold on the idea myself, uh, he does present some questions that are interesting to say the least. And, uh, I don't know. It's weird. Like I, I'm not here to take a position. on. I just want to have a conversation with him about it. Look and see how I'm protecting myself right now. Like, I don't want you guys to think I'm crazy. I think it's flat earth. I'm just saying there's some questions that he had that I don't know the answers to. I don't have the, the knowledge base to, to, uh, combat his position. Uh, some of you may do, some of you may think you do and don't really, I don't know what it is. I'm just saying he presented some inter- interesting questions, uh, that, um, I don't know. I didn't know immediately know the answers to, and like, I believe in a round earth. Uh, but as the episode <laughs> will show you, I don't know if I know why I believe in a round earth earth than that was what was told to me. I don't know. It's a conversation. That's what this podcast is here for, is to exchange ideas, for me to ask questions. And I don't always agree with the people. But that being said, he had some interesting questions. I don't know. Where am I at with this thing? Holy shit. No, as it is right now today, I don't believe in a in a flat earth. But I don't know. I didn't think they were going to fly planes in the airplane or planes in the buildings and, uh, I don't know, not do any investigation. But whatever. Uh, also covered, we talk a little bit about a Bigfoot. Uh, is life a simulation? Can it be? Uh, if, if it is a, uh, indeed a simulation, can a simulation be controlled? Uh, we talk about him performing with Joe Rogan. 
uh, views on uh, another controversial comedian, Owen Benjamin. He uh, has a really good uh, Tony Hitchcliffe story. Also, uh, another trigger warning here. He does uh, offer up a what if scenario uh, that will probably trigger uh, many of you who uh, find free thought offensive when it involves certain pariahs in our culture. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. All right. If you get upset about it, just understand he's not cl- claiming this is his idea or his position. He's using it as a as a thought model. Okay, a thought model again. Filter free America here. I just we just talk. Whatever we whatever we say just comes out. It just comes out. Uh, if you want to get to know Darren more, and I'm sure you do, uh, he said the best place to get in touch with him and to follow him here where he really wants people to go to is to his Instagram at Darren Chase. I think I'll have a link to it on the information about this episode, but at Darren Chase. Uh, and if you want to see him in your local here in the Twin Cities area where this uh, wonderful podcast is being recorded from, uh, he's going to be at a place called Dangerfields in Shakopee on February 14th and 15th of this year. It's not like every year thing. Like if you just listen to this podcast five years from now, he's not going to be there. It's going to be over with, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, the year 2020, uh, uh, that's right, a new year coming up. Uh, the year 2020, February 14th and uh, 15th, he will be at Dangerfields in Shakopee. But uh, I'm sure you can find him other places in the world sooner. All right. Anything else I need to cover? Oh yeah. Let me mention real fast. The sponsor of the filter free America podcast is simple website.us simple website.us simple website.us. If you would like them to build you a, uh, from the, from the beginning to the end website using the Squarespace website builder, that is what they do, right? We all know that Squarespace is supposed to be an easy website builder that anyone can use. And for the most part, most people can figure it out, but it takes time and it, there is a learning curve to it. And if you're somebody like me, you need all the help you can get when it comes to technical stuff. Uh, so I do what I did, turn it over to uh, simplewebsite.us. That's what they do. They specialize in that. Any kind of website that can be built using that specific website builder, they will do it. They will maximize it uh, to their full talents and abilities uh, and probably better than most of us can do. Uh, also, if you just want a little bit of help, uh, you, you plan on building your Square, uh, Squarespace website all on your own, but you did find a couple of things difficult, turn it over to them. They'll just do a few things for you, just help you out a little bit. And also, if you still plan to, to tackle it on your own, you don't want anybody's help, still go to simplewebsite.us, simplewebsite.us. Go there and check out the website because you will find some free tips and tricks on building your Squarespace Uh, website and they don't cost any money whatsoever. You just take the free tips and tricks, go about your business, build your website. Uh, Anything else? Oh yeah. Uh, Lastly, make sure you've subscribed to the filter free America podcast at your podcast listening source of choice, whichever one you prefer, whether it be iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, I don't know, some, some hobo in an alley. He just, he just reads you like, like the you know, the words all typed out of what was said. If you don't even like to listen, whatever, whatever you like to do, just make sure you subscribe. Make sure you live a rating and a review, especially if you're on iTunes. Matter of fact, if you're an iTunes listener right now, uh, just push pause, jump over there to where Filter Free America is located in, uh, in iTunes and Apple Music, whatever, and uh, leave a five-star rating review. That would be super helpful. Really, really appreciate that. All right, let's kick off this episode. Again, it's kind of a longer episode, so... Let's get it rolling. Uh, let's see. We're talking to uh, comedian Darren Chase. We're talking about all kinds of things. Um, I don't know. Um, let's see. We're going to call this episode uh, Talking About the Flat Earth and a Whole Lot More with comedian Darren Chase. How about that? You like that one? I should write that down. I'm probably going to forget it before I get done recording this, but whatever. Uh, talking About the Flat Earth and a Whole Lot More with comedian Darren Chase right here on Filter Free America. Let's go. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. Look into it. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. Look into it. 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. You just haven't looked into it, that's all. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on it. Uh, 
All right. So we're going to talk about all kinds of things. We're going to talk about the, the medical thing you had going on first, and then we're going to get off this conspiracy thing. So we'll start with the, uh, you just told me how to say it, div, diverticulitis? Is diverticulitis. That right? Diver, down into your mic a little bit more. No, diverticulitis. Okay. Diverticulitis. Okay. Diverticulitis. Okay. Uh, and I thought I had heard about it before when we were texting. I didn't know where I heard from, but you told me it's the same thing that yeah, Brock Lesnar, Minnesota's own yeah, Brock Lesnar had, yeah. which is cool. And you were a former pro wrestler. We got two things in common, man. Right? Three things, I guess. Minnesota. Jeez. Do you have a giant sword tattooed on your body somewhere? <laughs> Not yet. That's next. Okay. Well, tell me about the diverticulitis first. Like, what is it? Number one, explain it to the people who don't know. Uh, it's a, it's a colon disease where where you get um abscesses in your colon okay. with uh, they, they can perforate and then stuff that goes through your colon comes out of your colon in places it shouldn't go that's called poo yeah it's a technical word <laughs> you can catch it early and you can um just do oral antibiotics and you can do um just changing the diet getting more fiber and stuff but uh i don't go to the doctor and they caught mine late to where it perforated, and they had to remove part of my colon. But so by perforated means there was a hole in a, poo is going through your intestinal wall into your body yeah, cavity that they then pulled out with a drain they stuck into my side that I would have to hold off the side of my body. I'd have to clip it to my shorts, and it would pull out uh, this kind of poo uh, substance. And then they put another <laughs> you sell drain that for in merch me. after shows. Like you want some poo? Man, one of them just pulled out this bloody substance, which Ugh. is gross. But yeah, for a month I had those in my side. And I did one show actually at the uh, New Hope Cinema with those drains. Where right. I just hid them behind my back and my shirt. I didn't even talk about them. I just had them hidden under my flannel shirt. Oh man, that's uh, a perfect heckler control. I mean, yeah. But yeah, that that, that happened, and then they they realized it wasn't healing up, so they cut my colon out. Part of uh, they took about six or seven inches out which is a kind of a smaller amount they normally take like they took like a couple feet out of brock lesnar really so yeah and mine they only take a small amount does that make you because i remember that with with lesnar and i was wondering does, do you have to poo more often is that um if you if you lose feet i mean that's no less I, room i don't know how that works because yeah uh-huh. for me it doesn't seem like it's any different like you know but yeah. i'm no difference in change in I didn't change my diet because I figured if they took the bad part out, then I'm You're back good. to good. And so I got another 35 years of eating like crap before I got to deal with this again. <laughs> and when you say eating like crap, though, the, the you told me the cause of this is is meat well, building up lack, in these lack of fiber. So, okay. but a high meat diet or high carb diet can really build up. About, apparently, like I was eating a lot of pizza. I was trying to get Little Caesars to sponsor me, so I was eating Little Caesars <laughs> almost daily. <laughs> And, and I, it's not because the meat's bad, but it's just because the meat accumulates, right? Yeah, it just doesn't go through if you're not getting the fiber to balance it out. And okay. like, you know, I don't eat salads. You know, I don't. I don't get a lot of fiber. Apparently, that was Brock Lesnar's deal too. He was just living off beef jerky or whatever. That's why I think he just eats a whole cow. So yeah, that's really what he does. But uh, yeah, it turns into where you got to just you get fiber, <laughs> right? So how how did you did it, does it sneak up on you? Did you start with like oh my stomach seems upset or kind of I, I was I don't know when officially the diverticulitis infection was making me sick, but I, I think that in Vegas is when it started kicking in. I got really really sick. Um, it's hard to tell there because you could have just had a bad buffet and probably get the same effects. Yeah, it was after night that I was out drinking and stuff, and I thought I just over dehydrated myself and just needed to, to hydrate. Like that's what I thought the problem was. Right. And, at that point, maybe it still was. I don't know because I drove from Vegas to Kentucky, Kentucky to St. Louis, St. Louis to Minnesota before it really kicked back in. And when I got up here to Minnesota, which is where I'm from, right. um, I was staying at my parents' house in Wilmer. That's where I've been staying out there. But I was only gonna, the only plan was only to be in there a couple of days. Like I wasn't planning on staying there. Uh, I had gigs booked here and there, and I was going to go to other small towns, other small markets. And there was one day I just, I was in the cities and I, I just started puking up heavy, heavy, heavy yellow bile. And uh, I could not get comfortable. I couldn't stop. So I, I just, I drove back to my parents. I was thinking, uh, maybe I can recover here. And my mom goes, well, if you're going to be here, you're going to the ER, which I never would have done. I never, if this would have happened anywhere else, I would not have gone to the ER. I would have just tried laying in a bathtub somewhere till I felt better. Right. <laughs> like that's what was my technique was to feel better. And I was too weak to fight the idea of going to the ER. And I was very curious to know what was happening. So I was like, fine, I'll go to the ER. And they, that's when they told me it was diverticulitis. 
How did they, they do the, just for you, via cat, blood test? Is that how they, they, I, oh, yeah, I've had okay. so many CAT scans in the last couple of months. So that was July 14th. The 15th, I was out of the hospital on oral antibiotics. Okay. Then they're like, well, hopefully this will take care of it, change the diet, all that stuff. I came to the cities. I was doing a couple of gigs at the Mall of America. I did. It, I was just hanging out with friends, walking along the river, stuff. I was feeling fine. And then um, that Thursday morning, very very sick again, just uh, not not doing well uh, to the point where the pain. And this, I was back in Wilmer. It kicked in um, horribly, like the pain I never had. And I went upstairs. To my mom, I said, "Hey, I I need to go to the ER." And this is the first time I've ever suggested I should go to the ER. Is it is it like a needly pain in your gut area? Not even a needly pain. It was just such a severe overall pain. And what must have happened at that point, because I went back to the ER, uh, that's when the perforation happened. So that's when the um, the stuff started getting out. And just that pain, I, they, I was like, dope me up with whatever you can put in me because this sucks. Like I was in the most pain I've ever been in my life. And that was that Thursday night and I was in the hospital for 12 days after that where they were just, we got to do surgery. We don't got to do surgery. We got to do surgery. No, we're going to wait. We're going to do these drains. And so they finally let me out on, well, hopefully we don't need to do surgery and these drains will do the trick. I had the drains for a full month where I was just laying around, hoping that there was pulling all the stuff out and everything was healing every couple of weeks, going back in and for a little uh, x-ray every couple of weeks, finding out now the hole's still there. And then they told me I needed surgery. So it was just this whole ordeal. But uh, best case scenario, I didn't need to get a colostomy bag, right. which was a high, high percentage chance if they would have done surgery in that first 12 days. But because I waited so long and I was on I was on IV antibiotic, I had a pick line in my arm right. for you know over a month. I had Jesus. IVs just being pumped into me. So, But it, I lost 30 pounds total okay. <laughs> with the whole thing said and done. I would so yeah, it's a, it was a wild ride, but that, that, that perforation was the, it was painful. Like, did, did they ever tell you that you were like, you were like, if you would have waited another week, you would have been dead or they didn't give me like a timeline like that. They just said, if this goes on, it could be fatal, you know? So if, if I just never would have gone in for the, that perforation thing, I, that, that very well, cause I mean, all my shit was getting into my body and it was such a heavy infection. That was the problem. It was, there was an infection in there that they, your body's just reacting to the waste in your, in your poo. And then, yeah. And it's just it, that they had to get me with this infection doctor and all this other stuff. But I was on all this antibiotics for all that. And you know, they, they, they said it was pretty serious, but all the while, I'm just thankful it happened here. Like, right. you know, I'm in my hometown. My, my parents are stopping in. It's like it wasn't a big deal. You know, I got more time with my parents than I would have seen them because I've been out in L.A. and stuff. So, um, And it was with surgeons and doctors that have worked on family. Everyone was cool. It was no, like, worry about stuff. The guy that specializes in diverticulitis, colon stuff, was the surgeon that I was working with. And it, it was it was a very fortunate thing the best and the worst uh, case scenario just worked out just yeah right. it was like life was just like hey man just take a little break for a second like Re- recharge a little hold break. on so yeah thank goodness you didn't have to get the colostomy back that's like i'd rather lose a body part than have to carry around a the colostomy bag. second i came out of anesthesia the second they <laughs> said they question. said darren wake up and i put my hands on my side <laughs> i lifted my hands up i touched my side and they said yeah we didn't need to put a bag on you and i was just all right, I'm I'm good then. I, I can't think of a more unromantic medical condition to have while having sex. Yeah, man. That, oh, excuse that, me, that, dear. That's my bag of shit. Right that was there. the thing I was thinking. I was like, "There's, I'm not getting any action." You know, because how they do it, they have to pull out a part of your intestine through your side of your stomach, so you have a live piece of intestine right. just sticking out. That now there's rubber band piece of plastic is around that. My uncle had it. I, my uncle had he had diverticulitis, all this stuff, and he had the colostomy bag. I just seen him last night, actually. He was telling me, he's like, yeah, if you fart out of that thing, it just balloons up. So even though you have it under your shirt, it'll just balloon up and you have to go somewhere and release it. Like, Holy like shit. dude, I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> so I only know one person who's ever had a colostomy back, and that was back in my criminal drug dealing days. There was a dude, his name was Big Will. That's not his given name. Uh-huh. He went by Big Will. Big, big black dude, and he got shot in the stomach, and it fucked up real bad, and he had, he had the full colostomy bag and the whole thing. And you just he was a very gangster individual, you know, and you, you kind of lose a little bit of that aura of tough guy when you got your bag. Of yeah. Shit. You just got a poo bag <laughs> around on you. It's like, yeah, you got to drain your bag, buddy. Go like, drain your bag. Like medium will. 
No. Yeah, I, that was that was my biggest uh, concern, and um, the most uh, re- happy I was, I guess. Oh, dude. The relief when Tell I you. when I touched the sides, I was like, oh, thank. I'd rather lose an arm. Um. So so what is the recovery now? Are you everything's hundred oh, percent now? Yeah, you're, the you're staples still... are out. I had thirty five staples holding me all together. This the the scar is such a fine line that when it finally gets to the healing point of it like it's all healed and put together now but you know scars kind of fade over time i think this one you barely even be able to see it like it's such a you're, big, you're gonna big, have big that job. i had a, a appendicitis when i was seven right yeah seven years old and uh kind of like you i started having the effects of it like being sick and and like you can't really put a lot of pressure on i think it's your right or left leg it's, whatever yeah something like that here, yeah. but i was living with my grandmother time and we just thought i was sick Right, like, oh, he just got like the flu. So, like, I waited like a week before I went there. Well, it turned out it, it ruptured. So my appendix like blew up inside of my inside, and, and kind of a similar thing yeah. where you get an infection because I had to have the drain tube and the whole deal. And the the doctor's like uh, tells my grandmother, he's like, yeah, if you would have waited probably another forty eight hours, he might have been dead. Jesus. Yeah. So my grandmother felt really bad about that. I got lots of toys and and, and re- yeah, they repayment for the guilt, but. Dude, I got like the full scar there, and this is again when I was six, seven years old. But I've still got a very prominent scar right down the yeah my stomach that's there forever. Yeah, mine's mine's gonna be cool, and they took my appendix out too. Oh, did you? Yeah, they, well, without you're uh, in there, you might as well clear th- it. That's out. exactly what they said. Yeah, they go, yeah, while we were there, you know, just so it doesn't happen. So you, got, it doesn't you still got your gallbladder? Do you? No, I think they left that in there. Okay, there was just uh, the uh, random appendectomy that they were just like yeah we <laughs> just drew that in <laughs> while we're in here. Yeah, just get that out of there, <laughs> but um. Yeah, that was a that, that was, it's it's a it's easy. I mean, like you know, well, I saw the picture. It looks almost like a foot long. Yeah, it stomach. goes it goes around the belly button and down to just below the belt line. So that means they had your whole fucking shit just, I guess, yeah, spread out and playing around inside your guts. They gutted me like a fish all <laughs> while I was just lightly knocked out from anesthesia. Right. Here's my biggest problem with with surgeries is why they won't let you keep what they take out of you. Like I yeah. wish they would always like put it in a jar and something, and then like you could. Yeah, I'd like cool. to have my appendix pieces and shit. Maybe need to have the part of the colon they had or right on you know. your desk. You know, oh, that's my colon they took out. Something, you know, but <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's move from that. I'm glad you're okay. Glad you survived. That's the, and that's a crazy. God, that would be a crazy way to die, man. Well, the way I thought Just like of you it, said, in a fucking bed, they find your stinking yeah. fucking corpse I, dead it, by your own poo. It wouldn't have been a bad time to go out. I've done a lot of cool stuff in my <laughs> life. <laughs> that would be the least. Yeah. That'd be the least cool, though, man. Yeah, but you know, you gotta get that shit checked out. It, it yeah, it wouldn't have been a surprise. Anyone <laughs> knew I died due to digestion issues. If you see the way I ate, they'd be like, yeah. We all saw this coming. You should have died a long time ago. Oh, he was like fucking garbage. The fact that I'm not like morbidly obese to some degree, <laughs> you know, just how much garbage I've eaten, I'm just very, very lucky in right? that sense. Uh, well, the other thing we want to talk about was is your uh, uh, connection to the conspiracy world. Oh yeah, and you like me uh, uh, are a comedian who who humors at least some conspiracies. I got a lot of free time, so I like to listen to those things. Right. So let's start first. What kind of your your uh, your comedy or excuse me your conspiracy origin story? When did you first kind of start getting into the idea of conspiracies, and which one kind of first, I guess, made sense to you? Or um, a roommate of mine in uh, North Carolina came home from work with uh, all excitement, saying, "You got to watch this DVD that he was given by his coworker, and it was the Zeitgeist movie, right. which." A lot of people are torn apart, and all oh, those guys are one reason or the other, and I don't know all the stuff behind that, but that first Zeitgeist movie really opened my eyes to religion being kind of a little more controlled than we might have thought it was, banking systems really running things, and the money and the debt system and all that stuff being attached to it. But they also talked about 9-11, and that I remember even when, when it first happened, just thinking, like, how did those planes just evaporate? Like, metal planes hit buildings and disappear. Like, I'd watch planes flying through the sky and be like, that thing just vanished. Like, it just, poof. Did you Did you have any questions about it prior to seeing that movie? Were you? No, that's what I'm saying. The, the prior to it part, oh, I was okay. just, like, blown away as I was watching planes. I just accepted that it happened that way. But I'd see him and go, that thing just dissolved by hitting a building. Huh, weird. You know, you see a right. plane and, you, and just... It's, I'm, I'm accepting what they've told us. I think I heard people saying it was an inside job. You know, I was a senior in high school when it first happened, and some people were talking about that. But 
you just laughed it off, you know, oh yeah, the moon landing never happened, and you know, all that stuff. They immediately start joking and laughing off without any research. And then the Zeitgeist movie thing, and I was like, well, if any bit of that's kind of true, and I didn't know about the Building 7, and I didn't know, you know, since then, Building 6, and all this other crazy stuff, you're like, wait, what? A building fell down at 9.30 in the morning before these other ones did? There's, like, apparently a big plume of dust in one of the videos that just, no one ever researched, and but now it's, you know, so that one kind of opened my eyes to the fact that, uh, oh, some of these people in charge might not have the best interest at hand. Right. Which, you know, I never grew up political or any of that stuff, but I, you know, grow up watching enough action cartoons and stuff. And there's always some secret quote, you know, you always kind of think something's going on or, you know, especially stuff the, they slip in. It kind of like, yeah, makes, it, makes you wonder about other things. And, yeah. And then nine 11 was one of those like kind of obvious, like, Oh, this was, th- this is, this is definitely something. See, a lot of people yeah. do. I was, I was so for up until about seven years, man, after it happened was when I kind of, and it was only because somebody was, trying to like was showing me these different things is questioning the the scientific or the the scientific principles as far as uh laws of motion and all that that's kind of what got me to thinking i was like yeah he's right so this yeah. can't match up but there for that first seven years dude i was fully vested well the, in the full story most people are because you don't want to believe something that you've already accepted like i've tried right. talking to like people about 9-11 they've gotten oddly jittery and weird like I don't want to talk about this, and, and, and since then I've gotten that reaction with my new favorite conspiracy theories. But nine um, eleven is one of those weird ones where you just go like, "Well, why is there no video of the Pentagon getting hit?" But we have ten, fifteen angles of the trade centers. You know, oh, it's because right. of the trial for Mahat on whatever the hell the guy's name was. That's what they. That's what they claim is they they collected all the videos in D.C. because of the trial for this that guy it's like well right. why didn't they collect all the new york why they release why the news showing them why why this and that um how does the shanksville thing just disappear like you know some of these things just don't add up and the 45 degree cuts at the bottom of the buildings the people that said there's subfloor explosions the people that said building seven fell before it actually fell you know all the stuff that it, it, there's too many things that you go that, that like that was one of my first arguments i had that it was kind of getting me towards it, it was like there was there's it's okay if there's one or two things that seem out of line, then you can you can throw that to can yeah to, you know coincidence or whatever. But it's the sheer number of just weird fucking coincidences. Oh, a couple and passports that, didn't burn up. That's how we know it was these guys. Like, how right. did the passports the not burn day up? Of they found that. Yeah, the day that it happened. Oh, here it is on the on the street here. Yeah. All the black box is gone. All the you know it's just crazy thing about that day. Uh, so I watched that. We had a two-hour late day for school because the underclassmen had their testing, so seniors got to come in late. Okay. So I remember we had a party the night before at a friend's house, and I'm sleeping in my bedroom, you know, just sleeping in. My mom calls me, turn the news on, you know, and I need the whole story. I turned it on, just watch the second building, just get hit. Like, it was all live, and I watched it happen. I'm like, oh, okay. Right. But we're in Minnesota, so it's not really connected. You know, I, that, that's all that happened. I watched it. Holy crap. Went to school. Schools had the news on, but we still had school. We still had, did some classes were just watching the news, but for the most part, everyone kind of went about their day. Right. And then that night, I, I was like, okay, I just need to get gas. And I went to a gas station. And in Wilmer, there's a lot of gas stations, but it's not very populated. If you go to a gas station and all the pumps are taken, I'd never seen that before in my life growing up there. And I went, people were freaking out as well, far as what, what I could didn't be coming. know at first. So okay. I went to one gas station and there was like, let's say there's eight pumps. All eight were just taken. And I would have been just waiting for one car, but I'm like, I'm not fucking, I'll go down the street to the other gas station. Right. Every gas station I went to had progressively more and more cars to the point where there was cars down the street in these country roads, like long waits. And I went up to one guy, I said, what, what is going on? And he's like, because of the attacks, man. And yeah, that's when I realized, because I was so disconnected that anything had anything to do with anything. Right. But people in Minnesota were freaking out about the oil and we're losing, we're going to, you know, we're going to not have our gas, we're under war and we got to stock up. But every gas station I went to, even out in the country, just lines. So I finally said, all right, I'll, and I waited like a half hour to like finally go fill up with, you know. But I remember it's like it, it being weird that it was that connected to even in Minnesota. I was like, how is it? Right. You know, but I never thought twice of, after that. I never thought twice of it until I watched the Zeitgeist thing. And I, I was like, huh, okay. And then from there, I was, I was, uh, I just went down the rabbit hole. You know, I was checking out websites, you know, back in like, 2007 2008 
I was just heavily into like before it's news.com and above top and mm-hmm. websites that you read some forums and message board stuff. A lot of it really interesting information, a lot of really interesting pictures and stuff. And then started sprinkling in the accusation of, Oh, so-and-so is a shill. Oh, that account. Don't listen to that account. They're a shill. And right. then you got to start thinking, well, if there's these conspiracy theory sites I can find, there's got to be government agencies that can find them too. Right. I don't know what's real and what's not anymore. I'm reading some wacky stuff on these. But that, I, that's always my biggest caution. It's like I, I, I subscribe to the 9-11 conspiracy theory, yeah. and I have other ones that I'm very interested in and have varied degrees of belief or trust in. But the absolute thing you got to remember when you go into this stuff, and I think I talked about in the 9-11 episode, I just did, was like disinformation is a, is a st- oh, powerful tool yeah. of control and manipulation. So if, if you want to assume that somebody within the government, a government agency or, or element or shadow government or whatever – is doing something, of course they're going to use that as as you know camouflage to their activities. That's why Alex Jones is such a, a, a prime suspect for that because oh, you go, definitely. he does say a lot of stuff that makes sense, and then he says some stuff where you go, oh, dude, you're being wacky for the purpose of being wacky. That's why I tell you, he so, takes he takes like a like a thimble full of legit shit yeah. and then embellishes it and throws all the stuff in there, so it makes everything the whole idea of the things he talks yeah. about just sound ridiculous now. But that, I mean. There are some people that they think that just because you believe one thing that you're just automatically like susceptible, they think it's like a, oh, conspiracy theories will get you. Yes. But it's like once I believe you realize, 9-11 is a conspiracy, but I don't believe in lizard people. Sorry. That's where, where I'm at. Yeah. But the thing is, is a lot of those ancient like uh, religions and stuff would lead you to believe that lizard people are a thing. And maybe that's the higher power intelligence that's underground. I thought lizard people were like aliens and that's how they're interpreted. Maybe. Them. And that's, that's one of the craziest. That's one of the ones that like, I love the idea, like, like. Sam Tripoli, he's all about the lizard people, you know, and like with his tinfoil hat podcast, he's always about, dude, lizard people everywhere. You know, he's. I thought he was. I, I you know, didn't know he was serious he, about that. He, they, they were talking about that on the Alex Jones thing, I, I, I think. I don't, but I, I haven't I don't watched know how that yet. serious he is about it, but he's always talking about lizard people. Okay. Uh, but, you know, that's one of those things that I can't buy into because I haven't seen evidence of it. And then people like David Icke seem like they're just making things up and then they're doing all the speeches about the books they're doing, you know. But what if there was that degree of like, you know, shape shifting thing of whatever that shape shifting thing is that right. does live out here that we wouldn't recognize because we don't necessarily, you know, or it's that good at hiding. Like there's people that claim like Sasquatch is an interdimensional protector of the earth that he's can come in and out of Rome. You know, that's it, they can teleport and whatever. I've met a guy that has written any self jerky books. part time now. That's his. Yeah, I, I met a guy in Washington that wrote two books on Sasquatch, and he was working on his third one, he said, where he said, the big guys want me to include more picture evidence to let you guys know what's going on. They've used me as a communicator through, like, it, yeah, yeah. So that would imply that they're they're intelligent, they're not just yeah. bees, that they, they yeah. have some kind and of and they don't like being called Bigfoot. Uh, <laughs> that's what he says in his book, because it's, the feet are proportionate to their bodies, uh, to their size. <laughs> But not only, and, and this is all what he claims. So Bigfoot are like social justice warriors now. Like, don't not, call us big feet. Not only is there Sasquatch, he says there's also ancient ones. The ancient ones are the knowledge holders. The Sasquatches are the protectors of the earth. The ancient ones are about six feet tall and covered in hair, where the Sasquatches are the big beastly things that we know as Bigfoot and they're covered in fur. He said there's actually a difference that people sometimes mistake one for the other. So... These are two different species, apparently, as as? and they work together, and this and that. It's, he's got books about it where he has interviews with contactees. Uh, I, I've never had more like like maybe a, a feeling about Bigfoot until I saw, just saw Dan Aykroyd on uh, on Rogan's yeah. podcast, and he's a, a fucking staunch believer of it. And then some of the stuff he was talking about, some of the history of of the sightings. Yeah, I lived in like, Washington for seven years, and people there, are pretty open about it up there. They're like, dude. You go out to like Duval. You go out to the. the I was dating this girl who lived out in Darrington, which is just up in the mountains, and it's just forest. Right. And people will go, dude. If you stay out here at night, you'll hear things that are not animals we recognize. You'll hear howls and shrieks of things that sound like they're coming from a big beastly thing. Like then people are like, dude, I mean, there's statues for Sasquatch ever. There's all kinds of Sasquatch references in Washington. All kinds of them. I've got to go check that it's out. It's almost like going to Area 51 where it's like the alien thing. It's like that's how Washington is about Sasquatches. People are like, no, yeah, dude, fucking, we, de- we deal with Sasquatch out here all the time. You know, it was like, I don't know. I've never seen them. I've never seen no evidence for it. It's one of those ones I'd like to believe, just like I'd like to believe lizard people. But, you know, maybe they just are really good at hiding themselves from those of us that they know are going to talk about them. Or, or I don't know how that works. Right. You know, it's all, it's all silly, but. 
it's, well, if it's, interesting if it's, a, if it's a real small population of them, and like I said, that the, the forest out there is, it's not like a, like a forest and like a park it's around here. It's fucking dense. near like, infinite amounts of trees. It's and just go dense. Out there. Yeah, they filmed one of the star, star Wars, uh, wars out there, the, the, the tree thing. They filmed it out in the rainforest out there. I mean, like it's, it's dense wood and ferns and, you know, not only do the trees, you got like, just all green, you know, things could hide out there pretty easily and. And if they're intelligent, like the like yeah. the guy suggests, then and if they can, maybe they have senses we don't have where they they know that you're getting close and they they can do things way in advance, you know, and like if they just smell, you know, hundred yards away. Who knows what they but, can do? You know, maybe we're the hybrid combination of the Greys and the Sasquatches that made somehow made us, you know, and who that knows, makes sense. you know, that that whole weird thing. But there's just so many things out there that that do feel like we're. You know, it'd be cool if it's true. Right. You know, like like I said, my favorite, and I don't know if you're going to venture into the other one, my favorite one that I, I say in my comedy act that I would love for it to be true, like I would love for Ninja Turtles to be real, uh, <laughs> is the flat earth theory. Right. After, like, just hearing people out, I would love to find out, that, dude, what, what? They've been lying to us about that degree of stuff? Right. Holy crap, that would shake your foundation every degree. And much like 9-11, how people don't want to listen to that because it would shake their foundation that the government would never do anything to them. People don't want to even hear out the flat earth theories, and I didn't want to. I was I was caught up on pretty much all the conspiracies, and I listened to some you know podcasts here and there, but I was pretty much caught up on conspiracies. And a buddy of mine was like, dude, you should listen to this podcast called Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole, where they had a mystic, a conspiracy theorist, and a comic. And the comic is Mike Cannon out of New York. Okay. Um, the, the mystic was a dude named Tim Rothschild, who he apparently wasn't linked to the real Rothschild. They said, I don't know. And then the uh, conspiracy theory is this dude named David Weiss. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't need to listen to anything. I'll, you know, I'm good. You know, you'll, you'll like it. your comic. You like conspiracy theories. It's right down your rabbit hole. I, said, I, don't, I don't know. They talk about flat Earth, and at the time, I'd never even I'd seen some things as a by the way online. And I kind of laughed off the idea that we were in this little dome. It was like, okay, I get what they're trying to say. I remember when I first saw the flat earth model in a Bible, the way that the Bible depicts it. I was in the eighth grade Wednesday school class. I remember seeing their little model. They had flood, floodgates in the sky and all this. I fell out of my chair laughing. I was like, what idiots? Right. These stupid rock bangers. Like they thought this was the case. Like, wow. Oh my God, they're stupid. Right. So my friend told me, listen, because they, they talk flat earth. And I was like, I'm not, I don't care if a guy thinks the earth is flat. He's an idiot. Like, there's no way. I don't, I, I'm not, I, it, this is so inconceivable that someone could argue that point that I'm not going to even, I don't want to hear it. As, as we talked about before, you know, for disclosure to you, but who doesn't know, I, I, I don't subscribe to the, the, the flat yeah. earth theory, but like I do with most things, unless I have absolute proof that I've seen with my own eyes and can touch, feel, smell, and all that stuff, I always leave a room for margin of error. You know, same thing when I do it with with the vaccines and all that other stuff. It's like yeah. I, I feel strongly this is not true in regards to flat Earth, but I haven't traveled the globe. I haven't been all over. You know, and and the only thing I know is science that was taught to me and things that were, I was told to believe. Like this is the right. Earth, and this is so. Until I know otherwise, you know that the, there is always a, a possibility. But it's, it, I, I definitely, it's one of the ones I've, yeah, I've been guilty of picking on people. It's easy for. to mock that one. Yeah, it's very easy to go. Although we do, we knew that back in the day, and then people immediately fall back on that. We knew this hundreds of years ago, man. But if you look into it, they were still teaching flat Earth stuff in 1900s. Shout out to Rob, Eddie Bravo. Like, Oh, I mean, yeah, uh, <laughs> but that's they, they were teaching that in the 1900s. Like that, not even a hundred damn years ago, there yeah. were still people who teach people. That's not hundreds of years ago that we. Well, think. Yeah, yeah, we actually learned about that in, in the twisted version of history we got in school about Columbus because they were. I was telling Columbus, well, if you sell over there, you're going to sell off the side of the earth, and that was like the first kind of hint of that yeah. story, at least in my. But it, it just up. paints a different picture when you say they fall off the edge of the earth and that's another thing people always go to to easily mock it dude if there's if there's an edge why is there no picture uh, why is there no one ever falling off of it you right. go well first off let's say you did have the resources to travel to the edge of the earth as an individual it's a long way to travel and you gotta travel over a lot of ice and stuff you'd assume if there is an ice wall or whatever let's say you found the edge and you fell off of it who's gonna report that 
You know what I mean? Like some yeah, people go no. missing all the time. You don't know that no one fell off. You got to be like in mid- middle of phone call. Like, hey, I'm. There's a weird some blackness guy, coming. Some guy at the bottom of the thing. Hey, another person fell off the earth and reports it to CNN. So a lot of these like <laughs> things to mock people are so stupid that they made me actually start opening my ears to the flat earthers when I was like, well, it doesn't sound like these other people really have a real argument. Let me listen to this podcast. And I drove across the country and I listened only to the episodes of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole where they talked flat earth. And I heard David Weiss's progression from turning into a conspiracy theorist that didn't want to talk about flat earth, that that was reluctant to bring it up on the podcast is, hey guys, I've been kind of looking into this to someone that that's all he could talk about because he actually started looking into it. He actually started interviewing pilots and all this stuff where he goes, without a shadow of a doubt, you cannot prove to me we're on a ball. And it's flat. It's it's a simulation. It's this and that he was saying. And uh, I, want, I want to ask you maybe one or two uh, of things that are very critical things to look at that that help you, uh, you know, question it. But just you mentioned the pilot thing. What, what do you say specifically about the pilots? What well, I'll, I'll get to it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so he's talking all this stuff that they've interviewed X, Y, and Z or whatever. So I just yeah. said... Well, it's easy to disprove the flat earth by proving what we already know. We were taught that we're on a ball. We're taught that it's this and that. So if I go and find evidence to support that, then that's the case. And I went to like the Griffith Observatory just to see what they were teaching people. And all the models just kind of seemed like nothing. It was all individual things to show something because of scale, but nothing seemed to really line up. You know, and I'm not the smartest guy in the world or whatever, but then I go and look at the uh, the planetary models. And I was just like, okay, I'm looking at these planets, and they're telling me what the core of the planet is made out of. I'm like, how, how could you possibly know that? You never even landed on that planet. You just sent a probe past it or looked at it through a telescope, and now you're telling me definitively in this observatory that we take as actual factual information what the core is made out of, percentage-wise. It's half nickel and half this and that. You're like, how? And I asked someone, I said, how do they know these numbers? Well, it's based off mass and how things are moving and we don't have that much time invested in this current life that we've been able to look at this kind of stuff. If you take NASA formed like the sixties, 59 and 60 and all this stuff. Yeah. They had telescopes back in the day, but just with information and, and all this stuff, we, in the blink of history, we don't have that long to be staring at this stuff. So most of it, we then had to make computer generated image generated images of what we assumed and, a thought I had way before I ever heard the flat earth theory, way before I ever even considered that. I'm just staring up at stars and something they told us was Jupiter. And I'm like, I'll never be able to actually see that that's Jupiter without the help of a man-made object. I can't just go take a stroll past it. Like I can go check out a mountain range. I can go check out something like that if I wanted to walk on foot and find my way there. You know? But I can never see the space stuff without the help of a man-made object. A man-made object that's just randomly floating through that space stuff that we just send out there and left out there sends information via data to a man-made object here on earth that's connected to a screen that can then show me a picture how do i know that's correct how do we not know that it just looks all dope and purpley and weird because it's some fuck up of some energy wave that hit it and now it looks like this and that's not really what it looks like but oh wow that's a space image like we, we can't double check their work right. and i just started really questioning more and more and i went well like with earth we've only dug eight miles into earth but they'll teach you the core is this lava, you know, make we get the core, the mantle, the outer mantle, the crust. We know what it all is. But we've dug a fraction of a percent into the crust. Right. We haven't reached the mantle. We haven't reached the, the outer mantle. We haven't reached any of this stuff to know for sure. It's just guesswork. Right. And then I started looking at, well. And, that, and plus that's been taught for a very long time. So advent some technology we're, you know, you go way, way back. How do they, you know? Yeah, well, a lot of this we're stuff. We're still not to, advanced enough to figure out a lot of that stuff. No, you know. but and a lot of it, when you get to the science, you go, oh, scientists know. A lot of those scientists are bought and paid for. A lot of those scientists are in secret societies. Like, if you look at the like the, the early NASA astronauts and stuff, they're all wearing Masonic rings. They're all in right. secret societies. So. And, and they're, a lot of times, they're just working off knowledge that they've been taught. Yeah. And then. And supporting it. it, with, it yeah. And they one hand's working on one thing. The other hand, they don't know necessarily. Some people do, you know, but then the, the pilot thing, what's really interesting is as it appears uh, for people that have tracked the flights and I've watched a lot of long drawn out interviews of, you know, YouTubers that are trying to book flights, Southern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere and all this stuff. And they just, it fails. They get redirected or whatever. There's a lot of uncut video people trying to do this kind of stuff where for whatever reason, 
Apparently, there's not a lot of flight, if any, that fly from one point in the southern hemisphere to another point in the southern hemisphere. Every time it goes, if you're looking at, say, the UN logo, because that's the Flat Earthers map, if you're using that as the map, it goes as a straight line through the northern hemisphere, which on a globe looks like it's going up and down. Right. If you flatten it out, it's just going straight across the shortest route it could go. Antarctica, no one flies over the South Pole. Doesn't happen. They go over the North Pole. They don't go over the South Pole. The, the way you could prove to me the Earth is a ball simply would be to have someone in Australia fly to whatever is it, South America that's across the Earth from Australia. I don't know. Whatever the, the continent. Yeah. Yeah. You fly from there and then have someone else uh, in like Africa or whatever fly from the other another point in the southern hemisphere. I don't know the geography that well to know what land masses are there, but you have them all start geographically at the same latitude longitude line, you know, equally meet at the South Pole. All from your, your four points meet at the South Pole. Should take about the same amount of time, give or take a few issues or whatever. You have some film crews following it along. You get this whole trek to the South Pole. You could have a real time thing where they all meet at the South Pole, but the problem is. Is we got this whole Antarctic peace treaty thing going on. The Antarctica, uh, they, they, you can't do anything in Antarctica. The, the like, I think it was like twelve countries, something like that, signed this thing back in the fifties. Two of those countries being the U.S. and the Soviet Union, who were battling each other in the Cold War. But they're like, ah, oh, we'll sign this treaty for Antarctica. Right. Well, but ah, uh, yeah, we hate you. But it's up with it, us. It will be, yeah, don't don't mess down there. Okay, we agree. And it's never been broken. And then you look at the Nazis. I, had I always thought that was funny because that, whenever they when we talk about the poles, it's you know. Uh, which one? Wait, I'm confused now. Which one's the, the North Pole? Is the Antarctic is the South Pole? Is the South Pole? Arctic is the North. Yeah. Arctic. Yeah. Okay. The Arctic. They talk about wildlife up there, and they talk about yeah. explorers and stuff going up there. And there's uh, more or less some evidence. But whenever you talk about Antarctic, it's, it's they like, like, oh, there's nothing there. They have like nothing. three spots that some researchers would go to. Right. But they're like right on the edge, and like whatever the case is, but. In the 50s, there's a dude, Admiral Byrd. Like, I can't was, believe somebody's not drilling for something there yet, well, you know, apparently, regardless of treaties. Admiral Byrd, might have, his claim is that he flew past Antarctica, found more landmass out there. He had Operation High Jump. Okay. And he's had full explora exploration of all this stuff. He says there's like full resources, bigger than the U.S., just untouched. So that leaves me to my thought of well, what if the flat earth thing is real? I'm not saying there's ice walls or an edge. What if it goes bigger? What if there's more islands that they just weren't showing us that that's where certain resources and this and that were that they were protecting? And then I've talked to people within the military or my uh, people that have family that will just casually say, well, yeah, there are boats that actually protect the waters that people will scoff at. What is there? They're like actually physically protecting it. And I talk to someone who's got military. Yeah, no, you can't. You can't do this as a pilot. I, I, I couldn't just fly over to here. I got to talk to so-and-so and get these permissions to go this, there, that way. Um, and then I, I, I met a guy in Vegas that uh, I had to keep looking down at his boots to make sure that he wasn't a crazy person. Like if he had perfectly clean, marine clean boots, like military issue boots. Like, right. And the way I met him was I almost went down this alleyway that he was the security guard for this place to make sure people weren't messing with this abandoned building or whatever. He comes out and we just kind of got to get a conversation about comedy, but just one thing or the other. Um, and I mentioned conspiracy theory and he just kind of perks up. He goes, Oh dude, I love conspiracy theories. I can't talk to people about them because they think I'm crazy. But if you like them, you know, let me, can I tell you some of the stuff that I know? And I was like, all right. And he's telling me the Vegas shooting was a, it was a false flag type controlled opposition type thing. He's like, the, the perimeter is being picked off the same way I would have done overseas, this and that. He was telling me he's a long-distance sniper uh, that has written training manuals. Let's address that real fast. Right? Like when we talk about uh, conspiracies involving shootings, uh. often people, the, the first thing they'll say is, um, oh, so you don't think all those kids were killed? Or you don't think that? There's a difference between you know being a conspiracy that nothing happened and being a conspiracy that it happened different I'll, the I'll way than they presented. I'll address that one by yeah. saying this. Would it be the worst thing in the world if you found out those kids weren't killed? Right. That's a good point. Wouldn't that be a better avenue? If you found out that it was just a lie and that kids weren't killed, they made up these names of kids that weren't killed, and you go, oh, 26 kids weren't killed, but they're just trying to manipulate our emotions of this and that to push an agenda. 
Oh, thank God, the kids didn't die. Right, right. The people get so, dude, kids died. Right, kids right, yeah. died. It's like, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if that theory was right, though. So right. wouldn't it be nice to lean on that? Well, my, my thing but, is, if there is a shooting, and maybe there was just more people killing than you were told. That's, that that's generally what, like the Vegas thing, I've met enough people that have said that there's people on the ground and all that stuff. But that being said, this guy, going back to his, his uh, the point he was really eager to talk about was his training people on long distance sniping and telling me to my face no bs about it from what i could read from him we don't account for the curvature or spinning of the earth at all do you know how we make long distance shots flatten the map out shoot as if it's flat from point a to point b he goes that's how you make those shots if you shoot like you're trying to account for the curve he goes you'll miss and like he even told me about how a guy that was like further along than him he goes just kind of casually about it just flatten it out man it's flat and they just casually was talking about it being flat and i'm just like i kept looking at his boots like why it, it seems like and i add the guy on facebook and he's got a mutual friend of mine that's a marine out of la his whole la comedy career is based on him being a marine and all this and they're mutual friends I'm like what this guy, this guy is a marine his right. story checks out i talked to that dude he knows this guy he tells me stories about him his story checks out as to who he is and he was dead dead serious as a long distance sniper, we don't account for the curve. And he's like, the earth is flat. He was just open about saying that as it was. I still as, haven't. As, a, as somebody who shoots, I've never shot long distance. So I, yeah. I, mean, I think the most I've shot is maybe 200 yards, 200, 250 yards. Yeah. But in, you, you account for something like, you know, crosswind and bullet drop and things like that. But I've never. But yeah, you're to some of these people who are doing you know thousand yard shots, yeah, which that again going back have to the to, math of the Earth, which we accept being the curvature, which is what the point I made, which is I think it was off recording where I talked about at what point is water curve, right. and that's the point that got my attention. If the Earth is mostly water, and they can't measure where water actually bends, we accept it bends with gravity, but you can't measure the point at which it bends because people are doing ten mile long laser tests over bodies of water that are showing zero curvature. Well, okay, so the 10 mile body of water doesn't bend, but the ocean does. At, at what point does this stuff bend? You can see it go over the horizon with the 10 mile thing. You can still see it going over the horizon. And, but, and th that's what we, we talked about before we yeah. started recording that to me, uh, to disprove or to prove that there's something other than what we're being told out there, it seems like the easiest possible test would be to take a laser yeah. and aim it at a at a fixed reflective device on like a ship and say, hey, go sail that way. They've stop. done that. That's right. what I'm saying is there's people out there that have done these tests that are dead confident. I mean, they have the Flat Earth Conference that's only growing in popularity because people are looking at It's not that people are getting dumber and going, oh, the, 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 the Earth is flat. It's that people are questioning things going, is that true? Okay, that, that should be easy to disprove. And when I first started listening to them, and I still tell my, call myself an outside uh, observer to the theory. I don't... I don't like terms and, and labeling things one way or the other. If I had to pick a side, I'd probably hang out with the flat earth team, but I'm still sitting from the outside, just watching it. I, I know both sides. I can tell you why the earth is a ball that we were all taught that, but I can't prove it. Right. And one of the things I've come up with is explanation without Same. I, I believe the earth is round. I can't tell you why explanation without evidence <laughs> is religion. Yeah. So if you can tell me about something, you can't show me Then I have to believe you like a religion. And that's what most of science is. So I started looking at like if these people are doing these tests, if these people are, are are sending up weather balloons and it's just flat when they don't have a fisheye lens, it's just flat. Uh, how at what point is this thing bending? Um, and it it doesn't seem like it necessarily is based off a lot of stuff. And the the sonar, there's apparently just long distance sonar radio waves that don't bend with anything that connect that people just. And you asked me earlier, how does someone debunk that? A lot of people will just ignore those points. They'll just attack the person. They'll attack a different point. Well, when you told me one of the things that they were debunking, like the laser test was, was that laser bends with, did you say with gravity? Some people have said, yeah, oh yeah, the laser would bend with the earth. Yeah, the, the, the gravity is that strong. And people just make okay, stuff that's up. Impossible. Yeah, that's but, impossible. Yeah, but, but I've had that be an example. But again, from uneducated people, just as uneducated as me, but people that want to say they know what the earth is. Dude, the earth is a ball. I'm coming from a point going, I don't know what this is. I, the ball theory now, the more I think about how things will move through space, it seems a little less likely um, just based off 
the control that people have, the, the UN map being the same as a flat earth, uh, uh, UN logo being the same as a flat earth map, like just little things like that where it's like, it's, it's interesting. The Antarctic Peace Treaty, all that stuff. It's, it's seeming like this is all set up like a some crazy movie. And if it was like a crazy movie, it could be a simulation. And if it's a simulation, it could be just a flat projection that things are just built up on. Like if you had Grand Theft Auto, it's a flat projection. There's no curve in the game. You know, it's, it's a flat. When we were talking earlier, that was the first thought that popped in my head because I leave open the idea of a, a being in a simulation. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, then it's kind of similar to like, like a, I can't I just listen to a podcast. And I can't, they weren't talking about flat earth, but they were talking about something. That, so this is not my idea. But if we are, this is a simulation. This is a, a computer environment that we're in right now. You and I are, are just ones and zeros right yeah. now in this room. Uh, like like when you play a video game and you travel the map, and sometimes depending on how how fast your internet speed is, the, the the as you go farther into the map, the open world map, it takes longer for the pixels to form into the the shape of wherever you're headed to. Sure, right. So is that maybe what the Earth is? If it is a if it is this, I don't know. Deal, Again, I'm, like, not, I'm not the one saying what it is. I'm just saying that if it was that, it seems like it could be this flat thing. That makes, if it was this or that, you know, and then. It, an interesting point is again, space is a vacuum. Earth is a pressurized system. Right. Can you demonstrate here on Earth where you can have a vacuum and a pressurized system right next to each other with no barrier? I always wondered that too. We just accept that oh, because it's so big and vast, they just casually melts from one to the other. But you can't demonstrate that anywhere here on Earth or whatever. It, but space, it happens. It's so big. But again, you can't demonstrate that. What if we were just in this little petri dish that was controlled and it was in X amount so big, but you know, what if it was a projection? I've seen this really crazy projection where, uh, as above, so below kind of, they were, it's just this beautiful thing that this geography that we could be inside of this thing where there's another dimension on a flip side that it's, you know, alternate universe. It could be such a crazy batshit explanation of what it is. See that, see, that stuff seems more realistic to me than than, than some of the, the kooky versions. And again, those kooky versions could be just like we talked about before. Those could be the disinformation. Stuff or just people that think they know because they get excited about something and they want to talk about it. And, oh, I've seen evidence. You know, but again, we don't know. But right. if it was a simulation, which a lot of people, a lot of people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I could see it being that over anything. Then why would it be random balls flying through space? Like, an interesting point is like the sun flat earthers say that the sun is actually a lot smaller and closer to the earth and it goes above us kind of like a record needle. It just circles and gets closer uh, to the center for our summer further out for the Southern hemispheres, you know, summer, okay. which would make it sense why it's warmer out there, you know, whatever. But just think how interesting it is that we have this giant ball that we accept is 93 million miles away. But think of being outside first thing in the morning as the sun is just cresting, the second it comes over the roof, you can feel that heat. Like it's just like instant. Yeah. The second it comes over, that that's flying ninety three million miles away. The second it comes over, you can you feel it. The second it's behind a cloud, instantly cool, instantly this, and it's just like ninety three million miles away. Also, how do you measure that? Oh, you use like radio waves or something. You know, right. there's a probe out there, and it took this long. But then you look into those probes things, and like the, the Jupiter probe took half as long to get back than it told to get took to get to Jupiter. And it was mostly because people just weren't paying attention and they wanted the pictures. This is back in like the sixties or seventies when right. they wanted it, you know, oh it's back now. And this you know. how do since you brought that one up, how do they do people who subscribe to Flat Earth, what do they say about the the sun rising and setting uh the west and the east? It's just going around the top. It's just going around the top. Yeah, yeah. And people have um they've they've actually time lapse where it looks like it's actually getting smaller mm-hmm. and going away uh i got a buddy that's heavily subscribed my, my friend in uh, seattle that i did dmt with and we kind of you know nice. both kind of done that at the same time and uh, when i first started looking at flat earth i, I hit him up and i we're, you know we're gonna he's introduced me to a lot of other stuff or whatever and as soon as i said he goes oh dude yeah earth's flat 100 percent." and i was hanging out with him uh, a couple months ago at elkai beach and we're watching the sunset and he's like he just he likes to kind of like passive aggressively get the camera you know he just goes uh, a little loudly and isn't it interesting how dark it is behind us but just over there it's light 
It's almost as if a light source is just moving overhead. It's almost like a controlled light source is just going right over top, like just how dark it is behind us. But over there, you can see the light source, and it's just like, it's kind of interesting that if it was a split thing, the, the way the light travels, it's like, man, I, I'm not, again, I'm not smart enough to argue this stuff, but I, I am. You're, you're making me pretty, want to look into it. it yeah. Which is more than, because like, I'll be honest, like when you talked about like the Flat Earth Convention, like the only thing I've ever looked at into that is like, pick your comedian who's done a, a video mocking it. Yeah. It's the only thing I've ever looked into it. An interesting point is the first thing you look in when you look into Flat Earth, people immediately bring up Flat Earth Society. Okay. Oh, dude, the Flat Earth Society. And if you Google and you go to their website, Flat Earth Society, they say gravity is not a thing because the Earth is actually raising up at an X amount of speed. So if you drop something, it's actually matching the ground, which is absolutely ridiculous. I was going to say that. Okay. I, mean, the I hope this wasn't the, yeah, the good argument. But, but that's the point of disinformation right is a, uh, a good number of conspiracy theorists that are on team flat earth but will never associate themselves with flat earth society will say that the people funding flat earth society might be linked to central intelligence might be linked to government agencies and they've named certain people you know i don't have the quotes of, of well, this and that but it, it looks like flat earth society is controlled opposition why would you need controlled opposition for something so stupid as the flat earth right why if, would if you it wasn't need yeah. something in question? Yeah, if, if everything well, we're well, talking about NASA is true, that, why would you need control opposition? That goes into my bigger thing, and I've you know when I because like I, said, I spend most of my time with it's conspiracy talking about nine eleven and and it's um I talk about the 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 control factor of shame, you know how how critical shame is to to maintaining the the nine eleven official story is you know, starting way back to when I first started talking about nine 11, you know, people who I consider friends or I'm friendly with would openly mock me and make fun of me about certain things yeah. uh, concerning that. And it's, it hurts. It, it hurts. So I think, you know, it's in our, in our minds as people, we don't want to be that, yeah. that be mocked. Well, a nail that sticked out get, gets hammered in. You know, that's what I was saying. And people want to be part of the group. You, you know, so if they make these, these falsified versions of things, whether it be flat yeah. society in this case, or, or, Most, or the people who do the, the laser beams and, and hologram type thing of, for, for nine 11 is like, it, you, you want to, keep yourself from being in that shame spotlight. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good tool to self maintain yourself. It, I guess I, I just, I just don't care anymore. So I was like, I okay, just, I just love that. Um, we, we, I've had a lot of people want to argue me and all this stuff about it. And again, my point is always the same demeanor. I don't come across it across attackingly. I just say, Hey man, you take as much time that I've taken. And I know I got a lot of free time. Right. I've just left thing is running of people having conversation just to hear in the background is whatever i've watched tons of videos like with 9 11 i watched like a three-hour college professor type speech where he was demonstrating the the free fall how objects fall in the speed of free fall motion and how a building would never do it. like i was watching college profession le you know le lessons you know just, i put my time in right. to come up with the the, the conclusions and, and the things that i've went well all right that seems like it's bs I've done that with the space. I've gone to the Griffith Observatory, places that are accepted as actual. I've listened to the stuff, the debunkings, and I, I, I challenge anyone to do that and to show me what I missed, to, to show me how we do know for a fact it's a ball. Show me how we can measure the curve I, I and, wish I knew more ab about. That, I, I guess that, I haven't that, spent so much time. Thing, I know that, there's there's certain arguments yeah. that you know pick your your but scientist people, front man. What I've what I've encountered over like almost four years now, right. most people will say this, dude. What's it even matter if it is? Man, I don't have time. I don't. I, you know, honestly, I don't even care. I don't even care. I don't. Ha I don't care enough to even look into it. And they just give you that. I'm too cool for. It. I don't need to know. Even if it was, I don't care. But I'm still going to believe I'm, it's the ball because that's what I believed. Right. And then they just have that attitude about where they don't actually put in the time or effort. And like I said, when I first started getting into the flat earth, the, the people that I was watching the videos, their videos were going, okay, I'm going to start out by showing you my college degree. This is my profession. I'm not a crazy person. But when I've been trying to debunk flat earth, the conclusion I'm coming up with is that it's flat. Can you please help me? Most people are making the things we're going, hey, man. I thought I could debunk this and I can't help me. And then they became the most prominent flat earthers because they're going, I, I, it's not debunkable when I thought, you know, and, and most people don't have the time or the energy put into it. The people that I found that do 
generally end up being like Eddie Bravo is a perfect example. When it first came out, when Flat Earth first started hitting, I was on the train a little before he was. So I, I heard it brought up on the Rogan or thing where Eddie Bravo was like, dude, Flat Earth is a psyop, man. It's made to make us not believe in 9 11 and the government and all this other stuff. Like, Flat Earth is a stupid thing. And I've personally had face to face conversations with Eddie since then. Where me and him were actually doubling up on one of the security, or the, the door guys at the comedy store about how there was flat. Like, it was like, dude, show us, let us go up in the space station, show us an uncut video of them entering the space station, and all this stuff. And it was interesting how, how confident Eddie was about the earth being flat. How, how like, you could see it. He was like, dude, I, I have enough people sending me information. Like, I got it. Um, People are sending me stuff. I've talked to people that are doing. I've, you can't I've never met him, but every time I hear him talking about, he he seems as sincere as anyone yes, can be. Yes, and he's, he he feel. followed the same exact pattern that David Weiss followed. Like I said, from the deep inside the rabbit hole, where he went from, eh, there's a conspiracy people are talking about. Holy crap, guys! It kind of holds some weight. Oh my god, this is what I'm dedicating my life to, and and the path that I kind of went to, where I was like, there's no way. Oh my god. Huh, this is actually a good percentage chance, man. This thing holds some water. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't. But it seems like it holds some water. And then I heard Eddie go through that same progression where he's, dude, it is it is what it is. I talked to my friend, that same thing. So it just turns into one of those like, man, what if it was a simulation? What would you do? And then that's what I talked to David Weiss. I went and met with these guys face to face. Mark Sargent, who's the number one flat earther guy, they mocked him on Netflix and all this stuff. Uh, they put a meetup out there in Pasadena where I was like, let me go talk to these people face to face. I feel like if I look someone in the eye, I can tell if they think they're bullshitting or if they really believe what they mean. They're the most genuine people I could have met. The coolest. We sat around. We're, me and David Weiss were smoking weed together. They're just genuine. Mark, you know, Mark's talking about any question you had. He, he was a video game developer, so he's answering a lot of questions about that. Just casual. People sitting around having pizza together at this park. And sometimes people will wander on up and, oh, you fucking idiots. And then people will show them their models. And David Weiss, I have a picture in my phone of him showing a flip book he made that has all these points. And I, I asked uh, David Weiss, I said, hey, accepting the earth is flat, what's changed in your life? Because that's the biggest question. People say, oh, if, even if it was, what would that matter? And David goes, well, I'll tell you this. If it's flat, that probably means it's a simulation. If it's a simulation, there's got to be a creator. I accept that we're all consciousness from this one creator, which means I'm the creator, which means that I have control over my own life. And I said, if I have control of my own life, I want total control of time and money. I'm going to be the CFO of my own company. And once you believe it, he points to his shirt. He's got the Flat Earth Podcast. I'm the CFO. And here I am, a guy from New York talking to you in Pasadena. Do whatever I want. Money's doing fine. He's got t-shirt sales and stuff. Even if it's something BS that's happened, even if Flat Earth isn't real, people are buying his merchandise and he's completely, that's all he does. Completely. That's his job. Yeah. And he goes, everything I wanted to happen, if it was a simulation, it happened. Let, let me ask you this. Your answer may not be the same as, as, as his answer or any of the other people who subscribe to it. But the question, and, and again, I've been telling on myself, when, and when I've mocked people who've had the idea, it's yeah. like, and other people do it too. The question is, well, why? Why would they hide that? And, 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 and that seems like the easiest one. Why, if you, if you, that seems, that seems so easy. But, but this, I mean, what would that really change if we were a flat versus why, a globe? So that's very easy. Uh, first off, why would they have to fake the moon landing? And I don't know what your, your position is on that, but it seems like what they've shown us isn't I have a, official a, evidence. I have a lot of margin for error for their official story. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, the, the, the the even the lunar lander seems a little sketchy that that thing made it to the moon and then left they had the just moon. enough fuel well then it <laughs> left the moon yeah a lot of people ignore that fact there's a video of the lunar lander leaving the moon have you ever seen it there's a video of them leaving the moon and that the, the fact that people well, haven't that's, seen that's, it that's the the one thing leaves the landing pod of it right yeah and it just and it takes off from the moon. yeah and a camera pans up as it takes off from the moon in the 60s actually i think that was 72 how are they 245,000 miles away? They got a camera just pans up. They're controlling all this stuff. with easy joy. Okay, well, let's just say they had a camera that could pan up with it or whatever. It looks BS. It looks just fake. The sparks are coming out from the base, whatever. So this, just the, all that loon, you know, why would they go to all this trouble to fake something if what we were t being told is real? And then you say, well, what does it matter if it's a globe or flat? If it's a globe, we've accepted that we know everything about the geography of this globe. 
we've accepted that we found Australia, we found all these places, we found this and that, we know the center of Australia is dangerous to the outback, we know Africa is desolate and whatever, you know, but then again, there's a lot of things that Africa is much bigger than we've been told, and you know that it's it's actually a much, a much more lush area that the, you know there was ancient civilizations, this and that, or a lot of stuff surrounding Africa as a whole, like things that could be going on. I don't know enough about that, but um, yeah, we accept what we found. One thing about all. maps that I, that I always thought, and it, maybe there's there's a way to, I mean, there was a, a reason or justification for it other than just you know making the United States feel like the superior country. Yeah. I always thought it was weird that you remember earlier when we were, when we were taught geography and I say earlier for me, somebody in 40 now, um, they it showed maps. And the United States would be so much bigger than it really is relative yeah. to the other countries. Yeah. It gives you superior. superior that was, already. that was false knowledge that they were passing on yeah. to us. No one ever told me, Hey, this map is wrong. We no. just make this a little bit have, bigger. Have you ever picked up a globe in a store? If you look at the bottom of a globe in a store, it says for decorative purposes only. Every globe has that sticker for decorative purposes only. It's not an educational tool. It's right. decoration. They don't actually know. And when you actually measure out the land masses, the globe doesn't even make sense. The, the, the size of things would have to be, how big Antarctica would be, all this other stuff. They say it's much bigger, but on the map, it has to be so small. It has to be this and that because it has to all fit in this little confined globe, right. which goes back to the point. If we accept that we've seen it from space, we know what it is, that means we found it all. And you have your choice of these land masses we found to go to. You can't go to Antarctica. It's un uninhabitable. But you can go to these other places. You can check them out. And that's it. That subdues a lot of that exploration thing. You and I ain't going to space. And we, we know space is a tough thing to get to because we saw the damn Challenger blow up. You know, we got, it, it takes Elon Musk to get these things out. You know, we're never going to space. We've accepted that, that we have to have someone else go to space for us. So most people... We'll just go, okay, well, I really got uh, no real motive to do much. Uh, I'm going to just watch TV and let football subdue my conquering element. People, as uh, in, in habit, you know, just instinctual conquering, you know, the Vikings, all that stuff. You go to, you find a new thing, you find a new land, you find the new world. We've accepted we found everything here. We've accepted we can't go out of this planet unless someone else tells us. What mm. if we did not know how many more islands? Let's say south was just anywhere away from the North Pole. There wasn't a point that was south. It was just any direction you go from the North Pole. And, and as far as you can go, that's south. So if you just go south to one direction, you know. Even if it's just twice as big. Even if it's just twice yeah, as big, that's a lot. There, even, even if, and this is a point that Chappelle made on Jimmy uh, Kimmel, because he brought up that he had Kyrie Irving at a party, and he goes, oh, he's a flat earther. What do you think about that? And Dave okay, goes, hey, okay. man. Chappelle uh, on, what, what was this? Jimmy Kimmel. On Kimmel? Okay. Uh, he said, hey, man. I don't know that there's not more land on the globe they're showing us. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know he that there's, that? yeah. Okay. He goes, I don't know. You know, we, we, we haven't been there. Uh, we can't, we don't know that they're not just Photoshopping out. Let's say the pictures of space are accurate and everything does match up perfectly. They could just Photoshop out something and put, but if you look at the, uh, the Apple iPhone image of the earth, there's repeated cloud image. There's actual Photoshop stamping tools that are used and very easily and obvious to see. Where it's a clear Photoshop that people, most people have on the back of their iPhone, that they just go, oh, that's Earth, how pretty. There's actually stamped, cloned out uh, clouds that they've just Photoshopped. And they've interviewed the guy that made that Photoshop. And yeah, of course it's Photoshop. It has to be. Right. He said that. Well, that, that's something people don't know. We see all these, like, um, these images of what space is. And there's, like, all these different yeah, lush for, colors and stuff. and. And what people don't realize, all those are, are artistically touched yeah. images at well, the least. they're all paintings. Yeah, they, no, they all, are paintings. Yeah. They're cartoon images. They are cartoon images. They are, when you actually look into it, NASA actually admits that they are that. But they get sold as something real. Right. So we all think we saw the real thing. But here's the funniest part about it. Most of what we all accept is stuff that we know as space stuff and space travel and why it's so real to us. It's because we saw it in a movie. You saw it in Star Wars. You saw it in Galactica or whatever movies that have high, high budgets that have made it look extremely dope that we accept as Hollywood, but we go, oh, that must be what it's like. Right, right. Oh, yeah, it's got to be like that. It's based on the yeah. yeah. NASA, as a government agency, has been featured in TV shows as something that's never needed the, the name changed. It's always been NASA, NASA. You can use NASA. How many NASA t-shirts are out there 
Tons. Yeah. I started taking uh, Instagram pictures of everyone wearing them, and I got bored because there were so goddamn many. One day, I took a picture of six people in NASA shirts at the Santa Monica Pier, hats, shirts, everything. Everyone's wearing NASA. And I was wondering, like, does NASA need a marketing department? They got this whole budget thing. Why, why would they be selling hats and patches and stuff, man? That's kind of weird. And I looked into it, and NASA just lets anyone use their logo. It's easy. You can just make a NASA shirt and sell it. They ain't going to sue you. Really? Yeah. Every store has their own version of NASA shirts. You just can't alter the logo. You can't change the colors. Um, you can maybe do it colorless, but it has to be consistent or whatever. And that's all on NASA's thing, their website, about their T-shirt. Really? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so an easy way to flood things and get people to go, that's a real thing, is just have everyone wearing it. And your friend doesn't think NASA's fake. He's wearing it proudly as a, you know. And it's just it's such a big company. My sister worked for it for a little bit. But she only worked for it for a year. She went into it knowing it was a temporary job. She was in communication with people at the space station. But as a temporary person, how many questions are you asking? That person could be in Utah while you're sitting in Minnesota. You don't know. Well, have you had this kind of conversation with her? Have you? We've had slight conversations, but she has that kind of a uh, laugh off mentality. Like you know, she's, she's more into the um, studious element of things. Where I think that she's too bought into. Did she have any questions about anything? That she... Not that I, and I haven't had deep conversations with her. We just not that connected. Um, but I, I just, I think it, the, the, the laugh off answer of, oh, it's so stupid. That's just <laughs> what I expect happening. Um, it was a little, um, but it, it, it turns into, it's easier to control people if you don't think there's somewhere else to go. And NASA and all that stuff being started by Nazis, being started by all this stuff. And if, if we get the Antarctic Treaty where they go, you can't go any further past this thing, then we'll allow you to go. What if there was more landmass out there? You know, would people be willing to go to the office and pay their taxes? Or would they go, dude, I can build a big ass boat. Let's get a crew of guys together. We got nothing else going on. Right. Let's take over. Let's find the alien island. Let's find the dinosaur island. You know, we wouldn't know. It'd be like trying to get to another planet that we can get to terrestrially here. So if we see uh, UFO stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that it came from a planet how many light years away. It could just come over an ice wall or come from a different island a little further away that they're coming to check us out because the center of the earth is where all the chaos is. That's where all the species are together. And as you get further and further, maybe they, we have our own islands for each race or thing. It, it could be that. Right. We don't know. And that's my favorite point about the whole theory is it leaves so much to question, so much wonder. Dude, what if, man? Who knows? What if? And in the educational system, they're teaching people what the center of the earth is made out of when we've only dug eight miles. They're teaching it as fact. I went to some spot up off of uh, Vegas where it's some you know, rock landmass thing, and I went into their gift shop. They had a cutout core of, a model of the earth showing all the different rocks and stuff as fact. We've only been eight miles. You can't teach. I, I remember fact. that from history books. I yeah. remember seeing like we've all little seen images the, the of the core, the mantle, the outer mantle. There's just like fiery molten something As in the middle. Yeah. Fact they teach it that, but we've only been eight miles. God, that's a good so point. if you've only been eight miles, and the is there any any justification for how they know other the, than that? I'd, seismic waves, weight of things moving through space, just numbers that eventually you get to the point where they go. Have you taken a pre-advanced algebra calculus times two? Have you taken that class? Well, if you haven't taken that class, then you don't know. And it turns into religion. Right. You're not the priest, so you don't have the connection to God. You're not the scientist. The scientist knows. The scientist ain't lying. We all know the scientists. Or they're all genuine, legit people. We had Bill Nye, the science guy, in our faces all the time. They're all just happy-go-lucky. Yeah. Right. You know, we accept that to be the case. We don't know that there's a guy that's controlling the key of, of everything in these in with this secret society or whatever and could be controlling information where there are scientists that have spoken out going, hey, man, uh, two times, actually, they tried to prove the movement and motion of the Earth. Both times they failed, and this is a while ago. I forget the actual number of years. Both times they failed. Both times they went, ah, we must have messed up somewhere. They tried proving the motion of the Earth and they couldn't do it. There's a lot of these things where they've done it. They go, ah, well, we know it is that, so we just must be messing up. There's a lot of evidence that would suggest that so, we're not So by moving motion, through. you mean the Earth is not spinning. That's is, what is, they say. That, right. That's what some people say. We're just a flat, motionless disk. And then people go, oh, that's just flying through space. And you go, oh, again, now that's the heliocentric model. You only accept that something's flying through space and that there's giant planetary balls there because people have told you there's that. It doesn't have to be a, a, a disk flying in infinite space. 
what if it's a thing sitting on some dude's shelf that is, or a petri dish of some kind of weird ass experiment? What if it's a digital projection that actually has barriers and boundaries, much like the Truman Show, where there's only so far you can go before there's just a wall and you go, there's a fucking wall? There's a dome? Wow. A lot of things talk about the firmament, that it's separating the waters from above from below. And the, you know, then you got to get into people going, shit, man, that makes it biblical. Which means that the Bible is at some points, and I've been an atheist, and fuck the Bible, and fuck religion. But then people go, shit, man. What if we were created? What if there was a firmament? And they start going to the Bible, or the pillars of the earth, the stationary, unmoving earth, and all these quotes from the Bible. And a lot of people have been driven kind of to religion by going, hey, man, I was a devout atheist until I started trying to disprove the flat earth. Now, since I can't disprove that, I can only accept that we're creative. Therefore, I'm no longer, there's got to be a creator. There's got to be a God. There's got to be this and that. And that's what a lot of people go, ah, I'm, I'm pulling back at that point. Right. But. Well, that's the only only credit I can ever give, at least at this point of my worldview, as far as like a religious text, whether it be the Bible or whatever, is it's just an ancient interpretation yeah. of what they understood things to be back then. But there is. And it was more science-based than anything else. It was just, the, but if the, you don't have a concept of the complexities of the of the science then you're going to interpret it as as mystical or magical or sure. things like that but there are things that happen that, that like like law of attraction attraction and stuff that that are like you know miracle type things that like would seem weird if we were on a ball flying through space but what if it was a simulated projection or, or this or that that now you can create your own reality and people go oh, someone create the reality to be a starving kid in africa maybe in his past life he didn't have the comprehension of that and he just neutrally got shot into some body could have been a cow could have been a dog could have been whatever maybe if you have the consciousness to know that you want to shoot into a certain body or you want a certain experience whatever that's what you get maybe if you don't know then you just get some random crap shoot and you gotta live life till you figure out that you do have the power to go oh shit i want this life you know right. it could be anything or maybe we don't have our own choice maybe we're maybe we're not i was talking to somebody i think maybe it's on the podcast but talking to somebody about the the possibility of it being a you know a, a program or a simulation well who's to say that we're everything like the words i'm saying right now aren't a programmed thought given to me to to say yeah and maybe we are like a a version of what ai is where we're you know whatever's happening in the world with with fellow quote-unquote humans or whatever is just part of the our AI interpretation of what we need to do and how we need to do it. And it's just, that's part of the the game, if you will, of just letting it, the society build itself up. Yeah. Right. Wrong. People are different. kind of in the drone mi mindset. They don't really think like, like an ant farm, but for humans. Yeah. Know? And I think there are those people that are, have been in a sleeping thing where they, they don't really even pay attention to their own life. They just, well, I'm starting to get with nine 11. I mean, the, with the stuff coming out with nine 11 now that it's, it's, it should be blaringly, obviously, evident that the official story is is incorrect at the yeah. very least i mean we know that when the release of the redacted pages in 2016 that they were lying to us at yeah. least about that so that's a that's a fact now so but i'm starting to get that kind of pushback now it's like oh, i just don't even care it gets and overwhelming. that terrifies me it gets overwhelming but then you gotta think like does it matter if people don't care it, it really doesn't i i don't think it matters i don't think that it's our job to it does to me on, on an emotional sense. Like, I, like how can you not? Yeah. But I get what you're saying. You know, it's like, it just turns does into, it matter? Does it anything if, matter? If they don't want to care, if they don't want to have control, it's like, okay, then more for me. If you, if you don't want to take advantage of this thing being in control, that's something you can control fully. If you want to go, yeah, but what if it's that? What if it's not? Just back to the th same things. If you want to believe that kid died, that's, that's on you. I'd like to believe that kids didn't die. So if you can show me a way that can show me that kids didn't die in a shooting... I'd like to go, does that have some water to it? I'm not going to go, you're an idiot for suggesting that kids didn't die. I'd go, oh, well, 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 show me maybe they didn't die. Right. I feel better if you show me that it was just a, a, a thing. People love misery. Like you said, they, they don't want to stand out. They don't want to be the person that, that's questioning things. And a lot of that is being angry and being upset and having to have something bad happening in your life where the tone that most people have day to day, and I've caught myself doing it, even something good, some good happens. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. And you have this kind of down because we're taught to not celebrate our touchdowns and stuff. People get mad at you. So we're taught to kind of, oh, yeah, it's 
fucking Bob at work being a dick again. Oh, you know, you know the neighbor, this and that, or there's negative stuff that happens that people would rather talk about negative stuff having other people so you feel good about yourself. Oh, did you hear what happened to Susie? And all that stuff that ties into like what Eleanor Roosevelt said of like, simple minds talk about people, average minds talk about events, wise minds talk about ideas. The majority of what people do day to day is talk about people. Yeah. They love to talk about people. And what's an easy way to talk about a person? To mock them. Right. And if you believe this certain thing that I've never thought of, well, you must be an idiot. Now I can talk about how much of an idiot you are because you believe this. Well, you just explained reality television. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what the Keeping Up with the Kardashians is. Is it just, instead of talking about it, you get to watch it and live yeah. out And the people that watch else's... that, what do they say? I hate drama. Well, let me watch these people having a dramatic life. Right. You don't hate drama. You love it. And that's why drama keeps happening. No, I hate drama. I don't get why he's having my life. Because you don't want to judge your own drama, but you feel fir- perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah, because you accept you're that drama is a drama. reality in yeah. life. You accept that their life is reality, so drama is a reality. Therefore, drama comes in your life. What if you yeah, accepted that the drama wasn't reality and that thankfulness was reality? Would more lucky stuff start happening in your life? I would lend my personal experience that I've had over the past seven, eight years of just even considering uh, simulation theory before Flat Earth, before all that stuff, just considering law of attraction and everything, before I got into comedy, what got me started changing my mindset on stuff of, of, of hearing all these success people talking about controlling your own thing and, and law of attraction and all that stuff. When I started kind of acknowledging feelings I had and putting more thankful thoughts of gratitude, oh man, I don't have a job I don't barely have any money I can't eat I start going well I can get up and go for a walk that's something free I can do and I can walk I get to go for a, I don't even have a job that's telling me I can't go for a walk I can go walk wherever the hell I want right now I get to do that and I started feeling better about thinking of things I get to do as opposed to things I have to do or I couldn't do or I was unable to do this so I felt maybe you know lesser than or whatever so but then I started going oh, I have I, I can do this I can, again, going back to the point I was unemployed and almost penniless, it was like, I can sleep till whenever the hell I want. I can do all this. It might not be the healthiest option, but I right. can do something that makes me feel good. I, I can sit up and then I, I started putting into law of attraction stuff and, and the thing that people usually will use to scoff law of attraction is, oh, so if I want a red Ferrari, I'm just going to go, I want a red Ferrari. Where's my red Ferrari? I don't see a red Ferrari. Oh, I must be an idiot. You know, law of attraction doesn't work. And then law of attraction people go, well, you're going into it with doubt. You're going into it expecting to know when the outcome is going to be. You don't get to know when it's going to be. All right. But if you know what you want the outcome to come to be and you attract your alignment to be positive, then the things that need to happen in the universe will start happening. And maybe a person with a red Ferrari will drop his keys off at you and go, I don't need this no more. So I started going, okay, if that's true, I want cash in hand every day i I, that seems like it'd be a dope thing cash in hand every day right i'd like that and i had a job then i it was a a, a random part-time job i got where i was a vendor at the century link arena uh where i had to carry the soda and candy up all the flights of stairs of the nfl arena popcorn candy cotton candy get your soda heavy thankless maybe getting a dollar for bringing a guy a water up the thing we're selling four dollar waters and they want to keep their butt ears making nothing you know just just rough right uh and one day i was and we always had to turn the money in at the end of the night sometimes we got our tip you know if we got tipped we got to keep that but for the most part you're handing in the money you got nfl season you got more tips than soccer season but uh you make it, sometimes I was leaving with twelve bucks tip, tip soccer season. And that was all the money I had at all. Another reason why soccer sucks. Yeah, bad tippers. But there, uh, at one night I'm counting out my money to so I know what to turn in, and I go, you "Got what you asked for." I got cash in hand every day. It's not mine, right? But I got hundreds of dollars in my hand right now that I got to turn in. And I went, "All right, adjust the knob a little bit. I want my cash in hand every day." I want my cash in hand every day. Wouldn't you know it? Within no time at all, a nice blending of happening. I, I went into a, a dispensary in Seattle that I went into a few different times. Was dressed kind of nice. Started talking and kind of flirting with a girl behind the counter or whatever. And I said, what do you got to do to be an employee here? This seems seem like an awesome job working at a weed store. Right. I wasn't thinking it was an option for me. She goes, well, we're looking for a delivery driver. And I'm like, 
I could deliver weed. Who right. do I got to talk to? She's like, that big guy in there. Go, All right. Hey, sir, I want to work here. I started working there. And next thing you know, I started selling weed. I started having my own little delivery. I made my own delivery business. And once you know it, I had a box full of cash. At all times. I was just using to go to LA. I was just. I, How good of tippers are weed smoke when you deliver weed to? I mean, I didn't. I was never a. I, I wasn't in the weed game for all those profitabilities that a lot of people have. I was overweighing bags. So if someone would tip me, I'd be like, oh, I feel like I gave you more weed for that, man. Like I, right. I gave you the amount of weed you paid for, and now you gave me more money. So I got to give you more weed. Stop <laughs> making me give you more weed. And people like, let me smoke you up. I don't need you to smoke me up. I got all my own weed. Let right. me smoke you up. Got I got a truck full of it. Yeah, I got a, I got five, eight, six ounces. I'm always carrying on me. Let me smoke you up. I just sold you this. That's only gonna last you this amount of days. You're gonna call me again. Right. I know your habits. Quit wasting your weed on me. I don't need it. And I, I kind of had that attitude with tipping and stuff. And I, I gave away a lot more. But I was able to do what I wanted to do. People, are like, how much money do you make with that job? I don't even know. I don't know. But I can live like a millionaire. Right. I can I can play Grand Theft Auto till five in the morning, go to sleep <laughs> at five a.m., wake up at noon, and not feel like a shithead because my day just revolves differently than yours. I'm making more money. I can I can control my time, and controlling my time was a big thing I wanted to do. Man, that's that's a mind fuck if you think about that. This, yeah. When you when you when you cross bend uh, across the idea of of you know thinking things into existence with the idea of a simulation, like our thoughts programming and our is yeah, there is, is there is there a, the creator whatever you want to whether the creator be aliens or an advanced so race of some kind that we're all an extension of one energy that came to experience whatever you're experiencing you you got put into the situations you were like for whatever reason but some would suggest that it's almost like playing a video game where the creator is like hitting a and it's like hey, hey, hey you should be jumping you should be jumping if you're not jumping yeah, he might be getting mad and yelling at you, and that might be depression. Is the further away you are from the goal you came here for, whatever got you off course, and you didn't find your way back to why you actually came here, and you just decide to numb your emotions, to numb your whatever, and I gotta get a job, I have to do what society tells me to do, as opposed to what I came to this earth to actually accomplish and do. What I would do if money wasn't an object, what I want to experience, what I want to... If, if you live a life where you go, man, it would have been cool to have been able to do that, but I had this to do, you're probably fucking up in life. Right. But if you go, hey, man, I was able to do everything I've wanted to do. like, And again, and I say this as someone that just went through a pretty near-death type uh, surgery. Yeah. Uh, if I would have died at that point, I'd have been cool with everything I've gotten to do to the smallest degrees. They're not... The, the the one thing I want in life hasn't happened, and that's to have an action figure made of myself yet. But uh, at my first level LA goals I had, I pretty much checked every one of those off. Uh, to being a regular in a TV show, even though it was background acting, I was a regular in Grey's Anatomy. Oh, I've man. seen in a major movie, I've been in Transformers and uh, Captain Marvel, and I just you know briefly, right. briefly things that people in Hollywood don't brag about because it's nothing to them. But things that people outside of there are like, holy shit, that was you! Like right. I found that being in Minnesota, people were a lot more appreciative of the, the smaller <laughs> things I've done. But um, even to the point of like being on a show with Rogan at the comedy store. Uh, I did that before I left for, for Peru. It was the way that it all happened, the way that things lined up and just fell on my lap. Um, it, it's almost like, all right, I got everything I asked for in weird ways, not the ways I thought they would be, but I got everything I asked for. Right. So you've got to realign your dreams and realign your, what you think you can have. And some people are born into better situations, so they accept reality being a little better than some of us. Some of us are born into, well, you got to struggle, you got to save money. And that's what you got to overcome is those anchors and, and people holding you down, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's another one I, I leave in the, in the realm of, uh, possibility. I mean, who, who, who really, really knows. And that sounds like an easy cop out, but we don't, you know, it's no. like, we only know what we've been told to know. But would it be so bad if it was true that you could control things? And if you could control things, fucking wonderful. would they be the way you want them to be? Or would you alter some things here or there? And if you could, what if you could? What if you said, "I just want to alter these little well, that's things"? That's what it's like. I know there's, you know, we well, it's 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 it seems like bullshit, but there is a there's something to be said about the po power of positive thinking. Yeah, and visualizing something and to achieve something, and that's not to be that it's like some kind of magicness that's happening. It's 
maybe it kind this of should, is. Is it? Yeah. The, 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 there is a. So I always use this guy. See, the, as the, the, the reality of what science. Well, yeah. We think science is, and then what? What we're but suggesting what if those here? Science people were there to they blend together to, so easily. What if there were science people there to, to close the door off for you to actually know you can control anything on this life? And they go, no, 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 no. We found it all. It's space. We're a small little speck of dust on an infinite bit of nothing. You don't really matter. You're only here for a brief blip of time. Uh, enjoy it while you can, whatever. Would you dream to your maximum potential if you knew that the case? Most people don't. Most people go, I got to get a job. I got to be comfortable. I'm here, but I'm just going to die one day. You know, like yeah, just, just, just die me the adventure or the or yeah. The, or I've this. said that to my own parents. I've said it, to me, it feels like they're just waiting to die. I go, what are you doing in your life to live your life? What are you doing? You're you're locked into being stuck in this area. You haven't left this town. It's I mean, to me, it feels like you know, and it's just an outsider's perspective. But a lot of people are living that way. They have to raise their kids. They have to do this and that, so they don't really get to live a life. And I'm fortunate enough to be free and to be able to do all the stuff that. I can't worry about the people that don't want to live that life. I, I can't not live my life because other people aren't willing to accept this as a simulation that they can control. I can just go, hey, let me just live my best life with every opportunity I'm given because these things just keep on opening the d- random paths you didn't expect. Like one of the first law of attraction things I heard was you can't ask the universe for green or for uh, yellow and blue and get mad if it gives you green. Mm. If you didn't specify you wanted them separate. And that right. goes back to the, I want money in my hand. Damn it. I want my money in my hand. So you got to really be careful what you ask for. That old quote. But if you're in line, and that's where a lot of that meditation and stuff, and a lot of people in Hollywood will meditate and whatever. It's, it's, it's so funny. It, it, somebody just made me think of the, the next podcast that's coming out is one I, one I haven't released yet. And he's a, uh, a guy who converted from uh, Catholic, 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 I can't say that, ever say the word. Mm-hmm. And he's a Muslim now. And he believes in part of the, something I didn't even know till the conversation. Part of the the Muslim religion is they they believe in genies, right? The jinn. That's like part of it. And so we get into this part of the conversation. It's it's a fucking wild conversation. He was like in New York when nine eleven happened, and he it just, just a crazy kind of experiences that he had. We start talking about you know him being a Muslim and talking about the genie thing, and you saying that about you know being careful what you ask for, kind of blends in with the the idea of both the americanized version of genies and then what he told me about genies like yeah. they they believe genies are a real thing and they're they can be mischievous and they're basically a genie is is similar to what a christian view of an angel would be kind of but a little bit different yeah so they can create things in your life your jinn he, he believes that each they believe that each person is assigned their own jinn their own genie and if you ask for something or want something you know, kind of like the American version. If you if you rub the lamp and ask the genie for a wish, you got to be careful what you ask for. Yeah, because they'll give you their 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 version of it. And then yeah, the of it. So it's, it, it's just a passing thought about how what you're saying and some of what you get you don't acknowledge as what you actually ask for because it doesn't come in the form. You know, and then the whole Rolling Stones thing. If you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Right. So it's like, well, I wanted it to be this. Yeah, but you needed it to be this to get that experience. Now, what did you want? You so, wanted that big gold watch. Why did you want the big gold watch? Because it made me feel powerful. Didn't you get that feeling of power when you did this, that, or the other? Oh, shit. Yeah, Yeah, I did. Okay, well, cherish that and feel that feeling powerful. And then eventually things will happen. They'll align, you know. So it's like when people go, dude, I didn't manifest a car accident to happen. That's stupid. Why would I manifest a car accident to happen? You go, well, how did you feel when that car accident happened? I was angry. Okay. Was there any point in the past that you really held on to that anger feeling for a while. I oh, yeah, the fucking kicker missed the field goal. We lost the game. Oh, it's, it's so stupid. I lost money. I'm a victim. Okay, well, you felt like a victim back then, and it rode into, and life just proved you right that you are a victim again. It's giving you what you asked for. Hey, have you ever done this? Like, like if you're carrying, I'm just using this as an example, you're, you're carrying something that could spill really easily, and you're like, i got to make sure I don't spill this. And as soon as you have that fucking thought, you spill it. Yeah, it's a very simplified version of what you're saying is. But I've also you're, you're done manifesting that in a positive sense where I, where yeah. I've, I've thought of you know. But if your negative thought is like, yeah. oh, I, I can't spill this because this is a bowl of soup that I really really want to eat, and then you fucking immediately do it. Did you yeah. did you create that by by thinking it or visualizing it? Yeah, Something I mean maybe it was happen. automatically going to happen, and your premonition that you knew it was going to happen, you know, or but. Uh, I Mine's think, fucking I think, weird, man. I think people set people up, set themselves up for failure a lot more because we're not taught to be successful to the degree that certain people are. And I, I always use this guy as an example in the comedy community. 
uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, mm-hmm. who his career has skyrocketed recently. He's making a lot of money off his podcast. A lot of people mocked when it first came out. Oh, he's just making fun of uh, open micers or this and that. And now it's its own thing. They got all this marketing, all this product stuff. He's one of those guys that's very, very confident early on. You talk to anybody that knew Tony early on, though, like before he was anybody, when he was still asking uh, to stay on people's couches and, and borrowing money for Taco Bell, he treated you like he was above you kind of a thing. And like, <laughs> But he believed that he was good enough, whatever. One night, I was out back at the comedy store where it was after everything closed, and me, Tony, and a couple of guys were throwing the Frisbee around. And casually, Tony just goes, who would have thought Roddy Piper was right? A guy that performed for thousands of people every night, who would have thought that the advice he gave me was right? And it was almost as if, I didn't get out of him what he actually was told, but based off the conversation happening, it was almost as if, this is just a ride as you got a new thing there. It's just, right. it's all a simulation thing. You can make it whatever you want. And I've been around Tony in a few things where he's looked at people like a Chris Jericho, who's living a big life and doing everything he wants to do and all this crazy stuff. And, and the way he'll, he leans into that. Some people would argue that, and I'm not trying to bash on anyone's comedy or whatever, but a lot of times when I bring him up for people that know him, go, oh, he's, he's not even that funny. And people that will always want to attack the comedy. Well, why is he getting there? He's not not even that. I'm not even saying he's funny or not. He is funny. He crushes. But he also sells out arenas and stuff. And one night he was out back at the store. He was like, oh, we need to sell this memoir tickets. You know, you got to put the energy out there. You got to sell this memoir. And within a few minutes, it was sold out. They sold all their tickets. And just energy seems to be a very big thing that that dude firmly believes in. And he, he... just skyrocketed but again it comes from the confidence and some people like I look at myself and I I go yeah there's some areas where I'm a little more self-doubting or still kind of like yeah but could I really have that or I haven't really visualized what it would be like to have this that or the other but a lot of it that I have put out there has happened on smaller degrees um this is very fortunate lucky things where I go I couldn't have been any luckier for this to happen I just this year alone has been crazy. This year alone, I went I went to Peru. The day before I was going to go to Peru, uh, the, the, I, I was staying in Vegas, and I was flying up from L.A. This is in uh, end of March, and I wanted to sign up for the Comedy Store Potluck, like their open mic. Mm-hmm. And uh, driving from Vegas to L.A., not knowing if I'm getting up, and the host is a very big um, factor as to what you might get up. And I was just like, oh. What if it's my buddy Mitch, who's a guy from Seattle, who's got a job there? Uh, pull up online. It's Mitch. Oh, crap. Nice. Oh, okay. I feel like I manifested that. Dope. I'm going to get to perform at the comedy store before I go to Peru. It's going to happen. Mitch going to get me up was kind of my thought, but I knew I was going to perform at the comedy store before I went to Peru. That whole night comes and goes. There's a lot of people that got to get up. It's a lot of employees, and sometimes they can work you in, and I'm not at that point where I get a lot of you know uh, momentum in that sense, but... He, he came up to me and apologized for not even getting Bill to get me up. That's how close I was. Sorry, man, I tried. I was like, ah, no big deal. Uh, all right, I'm just going to I'm gonna go. And I started leaving the comedy store. I walked past Sam Tripoli, fist bumping my guy I was doing. I said, hey, what's up, man? All right, I'm going to say goodbye. And uh, he goes, hey, come tomorrow night. I'm going to put you up. Just casually says, I was like, what? Oh, you got your main room show tomorrow night. Yeah, I'm in town one more day. I fly out Wednesday morning. I can make it tomorrow night. Now I want a show with Joe Rogan, uh, Brennan Schaub, Steve Simone. Like just killers. Absolute killers. Would have been better than the potluck show. It was much better. Yeah. I closed it out, which was like a homage to Brody Stevens, who just killed him. You know, all of a sudden, I'm closing it out. I get that feeling of like, oh my God, Like this isn't a bringer show. This is a show I was allowed to go up on. And I'm backstage with Rogan as a colleague. Hey, man, you know, kind of what got me started in this whole thing. You know, Appreciate it. I got to have that conversation, which was earlier on. When I first got to L.A., I would love to do a show with Rogan. Didn't know how or why or whatever. Um, and there I am on this. I've had so many situations that felt like manifested, uh, one of which uh, as, as was weird as um, listening to an interview with Busy Bone from Bone Thugs and Harmony. Okay. And uh, I've met all Bone uh, backstage in Seattle. Busy was the only one I didn't get a picture with. So as I'm listening to this interview, the interviewer says to him, hey, since I'm in L.A., I had to look you up. I'm driving to the comedy store that night, and I was just like, ah, huh. I guess it makes sense. Bone has a house in L.A. They're from Cleveland, but yeah, they're in Hollywood, you know, whatever. Right. That'd be weird to run into them somewhere, sometime. And in my mind, I just visualized running into Busy Bone, but I was like, where would that happen? I'd, maybe a friend would have to go, 
let's take a night off comedy tonight. Let's go to this hip hop club. And there he is. And I run into him and I was just like, ah, kind of little passing thoughts. Not even three hours after uh, having the thought of it, it'd be interesting to run into him somewhere sometime. I run into Busy Bone at the comedy store, the place I went every night that was like, I didn't have to leave where I go every night. And there he, he fucking came is. I walked right up to him and I damn near says to him, I manifested you here. Like it was, <laughs> it was crazy. Right. Um, just those little things like that that happen where the, the, the thought that happens and you see it happening and then it happens. And some people just have a stronger third eye and, and you can see your future and you actually have to see it and feel it as it is. And you got to be in the right vibration of gratitude and this and that. But if you're feeling negative and all that, and I, that's where I think the going back to the why lie about the flat earth. What if we all knew we had that kind of power? Right. Would we be doing a lot of this nonsensical BS drone things? Or would we be explorers and and, and Which choice would you pick people? if you, you had a choice to pick one? Which yeah, would you pick? but we're not taught that. We got all this calcification of the pineal gland and all this stuff that seems like it's there to control you. And all the most enlightening drugs are wrong. I would never consider mushrooms or weed a drug. Mm. I wouldn't consider DMT a drug. It's a chemical compound that comes through your brain, but it's not a drug. Drugs are in the little orange bottles. They don't. They, weed is an herb. Mushrooms are fungus. You know, you can sell reishi and shiitake mushrooms for your body, right. but the second it's for your mind, now it's bad because. That's a great point. If you open up that stuff, you start realizing, dude, this is just a simulation. This isn't real. I can do whatever the hell I want in this. Everything. What the the main thing that I tell myself in life is I don't know how it's going to happen. Everything always works out. Everything works out. Everything works out. It did the best of the worst case scenario. Even if it's something bad, everything works out. I land on my feet until you start having those thoughts that it's not going to work out. Cause then no, you can... but that's easy to have, but that's, that's right. where the, that's where the training comes in. So that's, what, that's what I'm saying. Cause like, cause what you're saying, it, 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 there's so many things that have happened in my life recently and before that, you know, I was like, Oh, did I, you know, I thought positively about this and I achieved it, but that's just probably a coincidence. And I can, and I've done that so many times, but I do know that, you know, it's, I, I'll get, you know, in a mind state and, and I'll start getting kind of a dark spiral and like, this is bad and this is going to be bad. And yeah. guess what? The fucking bad shit tends to happen. Right. Because that's you can what attract, you're attracting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Attracting it goes both stuff. ways. And I, I even said that to my mom. When, I'm going to leave this podcast <laughs> attempting to, to actually use it's, what you're what you're suggesting the first thing i said when Let's i came out of my dmt this. trip the first thing i said when i came out of dmt trip was it's all about the feeling mm -hmm. feeling is the biggest thing so if you want to feel a certain way you have to put that out there and that that's that's and you've it, it's i'm not strong enough in the the teaching of it or whatever you know but i'm still trying to apply it here and there going back to this year alone so i'm i'm the comedy store thing, I wanted to do the comedy store before Peru ended up happening bigger than I could have thought it would. Now I'm going to Peru. I uh, I missed my flight uh, from Mexico to Peru. I, I had a connecting flight in Mexico City, and my, my girlfriend uh, was flying. What, what, why were you going to Peru? What was that? Me and my girlfriend are going for her birthday. Okay. Uh, but she lives in Mexico City. She's a flight attendant out of Mexico City. We only see each nice. other sparingly and uh, all this stuff. But um. She, she was leaving an hour later than I was leaving from a different terminal, and I had no way of talking to her unless I had Wi-Fi, which I didn't have Wi-Fi. So it was, the whole thing was I left L.A., landed in Mexico City, and was going to meet her in Peru. Next time we were going to talk was in Peru when I was going to be waiting for her an hour after I landed. I, uh, If it was a movie, you'd go, yeah, right, it happened that way. My flight left at 8.30. So 7.15, I had my, I got to the Mexico City at 6.30 in the morning. 7.15, I, I get up from the bench, go down to the, uh, I was like laying down, kind of eyes closed, but in and out of sleep, knowing I had to be up. Um, 7.15, I will go down to the bathroom. I go back to my gate, uh, which I wasn't sleeping by my gate. I was kind of just picked a random bench. And I was like, I was wandering down to the gate when I need to go down. Right. I go down at 7.30, empty. The gate's empty. I'm like, the flight leaves in an hour. This place should be packed. Right. So I go to the girl who I barely could talk to because she's Spanish speaking and I'm English speaking and we neither of us have a drink. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, what's what's happening? And she the thing. She's like, you're late. You missed it. I go, it's, it's what? She's like, it leaves at 8:30. I go, I don't know. It's 7:30. She goes, Mexico City is an hour ahead. Uh, oh. It's 8:30 here. That's your plane. 
literally points over her shoulder, and I watched the plane backing up from the tarmac. Uh, I, not even taking off. Oh, Jesus. Just, just literally leaving. They had just closed the doors. Right. It just was backing up. It was to the point where it's too late, and I started panicking a little bit. I started going, oh, shit. Uh, this could be bad. I uh, I could mess up my girlfriend's whole birthday. She'd get to Peru, and I could be stuck here. I, uh, but I, I caught myself on the could be bad thing. I kept telling myself, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. It's going to work out. I need, I need another flight to Peru. I, I need the next flight to Peru. As if there's going to be one in an hour. <laughs> then I go, the next one's at 5 p.m. I, I don't care. I can get on that. You need to go to this desk way over here and go talk to some running through the airport, just frantic. Get to that desk. I need I need the 5 o'clock flight. I figure I'll just get to Peru, find her. Somehow it will connect. It'll all work out once I'm there. And I knew it'll all work out. It'll all work out. It might be a few hours late. But it's okay. Right. Uh, we're staying at a hotel in Lima. I'm landing in Lima. Well, it'll all work out. I get to the thing. He goes, trying okay. Kind of keep that negative energy. Yeah, just it'll all work it. out. I'm just visualizing. I'm in Peru with her. I didn't mess up her birthday. I, we, we had a great time. And I'm putting myself after the fact. We were there. I climbed Machu Picchu. I did all that stuff. I'm just ha- repeating that in my head over and over while I'm kind of panicking. Is that the picture on your on your Facebook yeah, uh, yeah. profile? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting way sure over that. top of Machu Picchu. Okay. And, uh, but I kept repeating that over my over and over. I get to the, the desk I go, I need the five o'clock ticket. I need the five o'clock ticket. Get, 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 whatever. He goes, okay. All we have, though, is business class. Thousand dollars. <laughs> what? He's a thousand US dollars. I go, I don't have a thousand US dollars, especially for a ticket. What? No. Uh oh. Now I'm starting to lose a little bit of hope. And I'm going, everything worked out. Everything worked out. I need Wi Fi. I need Wi Fi. And I'm rushing to find Wi Fi. I found Wi Fi. Took me a while to get a hold of my girlfriend. She's not checking her Facebook. She's in her line, and, you know, going through all their stuff. Right. She's flying to Peru, getting ready for her birthday stuff. And finally, I, I get a hold of her. Problem, problem, problem. And I, I miss my flight. And she just goes, "Get over here. Find your way to the second terminal," which was a challenge in itself. I had already converted my money to Peruvian, so I gave <laughs> the Peruvian money. I got back, got over there. She was able to buy my ticket. Uh, she had to buy the ticket. She didn't get it free working for airliner. She paid for it. Uh, very lucky. Like I said, a lot of gratefulness happens and stuff. She, I, I flew to Peru with her on the same flight. It was actually a much better trip. We got there together. Got all this cool stuff. and Everything worked out. Everything worked out. I get back from uh, Peru to find out I, I no longer live in the house I was living in in Vegas. They didn't want someone sleeping in their living room. So now I'm just living in my car again. Done that before. But now I'm in Vegas. All right. Not a big deal. Um... Not long after that, I mean, it was like uh, June, early June or uh, late May, I, I, th- I think. I don't remember at this point in time. Uh, my car was stolen. I was living in my car. Everything I owned was in my car. Everything I owned was in my car. Gone. And I'm just there like, I, I'm in fucking Vegas. The comedy community reached out. You can stay at my place. You can stay at so I got places to stay. I had some gigs up in Seattle that I was like, I think I got to cancel these things. But one of the comics from Seattle, Susan Jones, who's kind of like the mother of the scene up there. She looks out for people and stuff. She saw what I posted on Facebook. I lot my car got stolen. She reached out. She said, Hey, do you need to talk anything? You know, can I, can I help with anything? I said, I got these Seattle gigs. I don't know what to do. She goes, come up here. You can stay with me. You can use my car to get to the gigs. I just had a little bit of hope. Wow. Everything's going to work out. Sure enough, I get to Seattle. And she put a GoFundMe out there for me that I didn't expect to have happen. I got this minivan now. That was paid. Everything worked out. I'm driving back from Seattle. I flew there one-way ticket. I'm driving back in a van. Everything worked out. Wow. Van gets broken into. I had all this stuff in my van, in my uh, car from my friend was holding out to it in Seattle. All the stuff that I lost everything in my car getting stolen. But this whole other life I had before comedy, before I when I left Seattle, I just left a whole bunch of stuff. I was an asshole. I just left this house just my essentials and it was like hey if you guys throw away all my stuff you throw away i'm not cleaning nothing up and this one guy just kept it all in bins all as it was and um one of those bins is a box of dvds like old dvds i had that i started selling after shows I, I'd, I'd make the joke i go hey, i got my stuff stolen but i'm selling dvds if you guys want dumb and dumber me myself and irene <laughs> people loved it and i sold dvds i stole all three of my steve-o dvds for like 20 bucks he's like i made more money on selling a few dvds than I would have made pawning all the DVDs. Yeah. But I left I my car about and like... just start selling other comics albums after my show. Yeah. Shows. I mean, I, I, sold, <laughs> I sold anything. Um, DVDs are just the funnier thing. Right. But then my car gets broken into in Vegas. My van does because I left it unlocked. And they took all the stuff that I had from Seattle. 
that when I originally picked it up for my friend's house, I was just like, you know what? This is all stuff that I, as, as useful as it was because I lost everything. Mm-hmm. Now I got all these bins of stuff and I got some new clothes. Oh, cool. I got it. Oh, I forgot about this. Oh, I can really use this. Oh, dope. Now I got this. I got this. It was also taking up a lot of room in my van and I was like, God, I kind of wish I didn't have all this stuff. <laughs> Maybe I can just go drop it off at my parents' house in Wilmer or something. I go up through there. But then everything got stolen. Right. You manifested they, it. They, they, but they left my, my essential stuff. They left like a few t-shirts, enough t-shirts this time where I didn't have to go to the store and buy some more t-shirts. Right. They left my bedding and stuff where I was like, oh, wow. And yeah, I I, I kind of manifest all this stuff to go away as, as much as, as it kind of is a bummer that I don't have it no more. It's also like, I, I also accepted I didn't have it before. And now it's just gone. And they left me everything I needed. And I, I kind of kept the mentality of I always have everything I need. Even when everything was gone, I had people willing to let me stay at their place. I had people that were willing to help out. I had everything I needed. I had the ability to eat. I had a job. I had this and that. I could do everything I needed to do, which goes back to the being grateful for when I was unemployed and going, I can go for a walk. I get to go for a walk right now if I want to, which might not be what I would love to do in this scenario, but other people can't. That's, and I can. This is, the whole idea is is if you do, from the outside looking in, it, it's a fucking mind trip to think that if our successes and failures in life, if, if they were really as simple as being con- controlled by our thoughts. I mean, the bigger your thoughts, the bigger your dreams or aspirations. Yeah, it, but it seems like that. The, we talk the to more them. you could achieve. A lot of people out there, man. A lot of the you, you look at every successful individual, be it if it's a in technology or entertainment or something Will like Smith, that. Denzel they, Washington. They fucking yeah. believed their way. Yeah. yeah, or at least they they started in that point where well, I I see myself doing that, yeah. and I'm going to do that. Visualization is a huge thing. That's why meditation. That's why I in, in all this time I've been laid up. My if I have a regret, it's that I didn't spend any time meditating. I've literally just been locked on my phone. Like right. I'm so addicted to checking my phone for just status are. updates and stuff. And that's the one thing I'm kind of trying to break now is my addiction to screens and technology and stuff. Just accepting the world for as it is. But I've also these conversations. Not to cut you off, but these conversations right here. Th- this has been so therapeutic as far as technology for me. It's, yeah. it's, it being even though we have you know electronic devices here recording our voices. You know, before I started doing the podcasting thing, I've never had these kind of long drawn out face to face conversations with yeah. people. And I love that I, I put my phone down, and we're, we've been talking for over an hour now. Haven't looked at my phone. Haven't felt yeah. the need to do it because I'm enjoying this this interaction, this conversation that we're you having. You can do that too. It's like going to a store. You go to a grocery store. You go, yeah. do I need my phone when I'm in there? No, I'll leave it in the car. And yeah, you can leave. You know, you can leave things. I I I'll sometimes just leave something at home. You know, when I had a home, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, just just go places. You know, go for a walk without it. So I'm not checking it all the time. You know. Uh, but yeah, it's a naked feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Like when you forget a phone somewhere and you're like, holy fuck. But it's also I... freeing when you get to that point when you don't have to check. You're like, yeah, that's yeah. right. I have my phone. Like, that, for me, it helped in Mexico. I was in Mexico for three weeks. My phone only worked on Wi-Fi. So I just never uh. brought my phone anywhere. We just use my girlfriend's phone anywhere because hers worked on the service. So we use her phone for pictures and we use her phone for this and that. I don't need my phone. We're together. Who am I going to call? And I just, but I'm... then as soon as we got back to the hotel room, Right on my phone, checking other stuff. I get all these, you know, catch up on Facebook, catch up on this and that. And I, I use the excuse of, well, I, I missed all this stuff. It is and a dopamine rush. Yeah, get that you get the fear there. of missing out, you know. And I might miss that YouTube release that just came out a minute ago that I can say I watch right away, you know, all that stuff. But it, um, I know I've got to work because my, that's the, the, well, I do a lot of things to piss my girlfriend off. But the thing I do the most of this is off. Is like if we go out to eat or somewhere, and then I'm constantly on my phone. Yeah, and I and I do that, and I always use excuse. Well, uh, I'm I'm writing a funny joke. Yeah, you know, I'm doing as my a, job as a comic. As a comic, can... which is it oftentimes is true, but then I oftentimes I'm just fucking staring like a fucking slob with drool running down my face. Yeah, worried about the next fucking update about something that matters not in the in the big picture of things in our life. Yeah, and what I've been trying to do instead of uh, harping on, my, on myself for doing that, like, oh, I can't believe I go, at least I get to do that. You know, like right. it goes back to that, <laughs> hey, I, I can. Right. I, I, I'm doing it because I can and because that's what I wanted to do. Now, if, I'm pretty future, sure the way I am with my phone, it's because I can't not do it. It's, there's definitely an addiction yeah. there. I know it is. and it's Yeah, we it's are addicted, but, but it's, you know, we have the ability to be able to do that. You know, we, yeah. there, if you think about, like, edge, so even it. if you were fully addicted to your phone as a, just staring at it all the time, what did you want as a kid? And a lot of times what we would create and play with was like these space age telecommunicators that we pretended we can communicate with anyone in the planet. We could 
control things and this just did this to you this just did that you know right, right. we created these weird little looking remote control the super remote or you know whatever they, these little things that kids would create yeah and now we have it that's true and we go oh, i don't want this and you go that, yeah you did as a kid that's exactly what you what pretended want. what you wanted all the time you it's wanted more than what we wanted it's yeah. more than we could even even fathom exactly. at that age but so that's when i started kind of embracing it a little bit going ah, it's kind of what i wanted to to be the thing and you know, I, I wanted that connectivity to stuff now i'm connected now i'm you know i'm having Sometimes yeah, you can make arguments for it either way, but it, it, yeah. it when you really sit down and look, at least from my point of view, it's it it, it is the the sla- it's everything. It's the slave chain. It's the tracking device. Well, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the there's so much negative. The it's, the, it's, the pre- it's the funnel of porn that I don't have to go anywhere to look at fucking titties. They're right yeah. fucking here in this little box. It's all that little precursor to the chip. Which if I had to make an argument, I would probably make the argument that the chip is what we want to stray away from. Mm-hmm. But I could also make the argument that that's what we need to work towards. The idea it, of it's not bad. It's it's the what could be done with it. Right. And, uh, and who's if, in control and who's the one pushing what the What if our only way out of uh, the risk of um, death was to create an infinite world in a simulated... In a, in a, or what if the only way to reincarnate was to not have the chip? And those that had the chip couldn't reincarnate. And that was the whole story of Jesus. I'm a son of God. You know, I'm I'm all natural. I'll reincarnate. You know, what, what if you didn't have that ability to reincarnate because you got the chip? And what if you knew that you had the chip, and by having the chip, you couldn't reincarnate? But someone was telling you that they could. Would you maybe look at them and go, "Well, you think you're better than me because you can come back to this life?" Well, if you can come back to this life, why don't I just put that to the test and give you a little kill here? Why don't we just kill this guy if he says he can come back? You know, that maybe the whole story of Jesus, the whole, I'm a son of God, I'll come back. All right, let's test that theory. You know, like, that's just how I kind of visualized the chip oh, thing sure. going in the future with just the dummy redneck people that were sold on needing the chip. And then if you did realize that all your stuff was controlled and here's a guy that doesn't have a chip, like what happened in Id- Idiocracy when they realized that he was uh, not didn't have the barcode? You're unscannable. And they start freaking out. Uh, oh, yeah. man. You know, like, what if the just society was pushing us towards the chip because that's the way you control it, you know, and you got to go AWOL and all the, you know, who knows? Like that, that to me is my biggest thing is like, ah, damn it. I'll probably be killed because I don't want the chip and they'll go uh, reincarnate then idiot, you know, but what if we kept reincarnating to the point where we had enough technology to build a chip so essentially, that was our spaceship off of this dying planet, right? And, and there was a faction of people that wanted you to believe that the chip was the Antichrist, you know, the, the the mark of the beast. It, it's so weird that you look at like Christianity as a whole, and you go, "What if they were the Antichrist teaching us that they're the right ones?" You know, like there's there's all the what ifs, you know, and we don't know. All right. But it's fun to wonder, you know. But that's where a lot of people get overwhelmed, and that's where I I appreciate being a comic and having nothing but free time to go on. I can think about that, and it doesn't explore, hurt my brain no yeah, more. Explore the thought, regardless you, you if, if you believe head. in it or not, or, yeah. or if it's right or wrong. There's there's no harm in exploring thought. That's a Shakespeare. There's nothing's wrong or right, but thinking makes it so. And it's like it doesn't have to be wrong. What if oh your government wouldn't kill three thousand people? What if they didn't think it was wrong to do that because they knew you'd reincarnate in another body if you just died here? What if they knew the second they killed the three thousand people, there's three thousand other beings being born into this planet? They're going to be shot into randomly. Right. What if that's the case? What if they knew? What if like in or what if it's Dado, just so simple as like they think the 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 ends justify the means? You know, and, and could be that or they just don't feel. Yeah, I mean, it it could be any of that stuff. Yeah, there's so many. But like, what if life was like Grand Theft Auto, where you just reincarnated in the nearest hospital? Just maybe it's a different uh, <laughs> dimension where right. everything else is similar, but the fact you died wasn't. You know, maybe. What if what if you realized that when you died, you played it too safe? Right. You know what I mean? Like, what if you didn't? live the life you wanted to live and dream the way you wanted to dream and you know have all the time you want or whatever your dream is you know if you you can watch someone you can freeze someone up and watch them just lock up if you ask them the simple question of if money was no object what would you do they go i don't know i never, never thought of that if you had no limitation no financial limitations if money whatsoever. wasn't an object yeah so if you know and like for me, it was like I'd love to travel. I'd love to. I'd love to be heard. You know, all this stuff. Like these little little things that you start assessing and start really defining what it is you want and what you want to feel and all this stuff. And stand up comedy has just been the perfect thing. I've gotten to travel. Things gotten paid for. Everything's, 
even though I don't have excess of all this other stuff, maybe I don't need to have that right now because it needs to build character. Maybe I needed to lose all my stuff to realize I had everything I needed. You know what I mean? Right. Maybe that happened for the reason to teach me I was fine without it. Maybe it took away the identity of, of, of oh, that is mine. No, it's not. It's a thing that you had for a little bit. It isn't yours. It's a thing. And right. you don't have to identify yourself by this possession. You can just be a dude enjoying the hell out of life. And I was like, yeah, I see a lot of cool stuff. I can go wherever I want. It's beautiful outside. You know, there's times in California where I had nothing. I was living in my car. I'd just take a walk and it just dawned on me. Man, I'm, I'm in Southern California. I grew up in Minnesota. I'm in Southern California. There's palm trees everywhere. And I'm just walking around with no guidance or structure. I don't have to be anywhere. There's nothing I need to do. I, I can walk. I can do this. And then generally, something would happen on that walk that would make me feel good, like helping someone. This one lady had a flat tire. And I wasn't able to help her with their flat tire. I didn't have this, but I was able to flag down someone that was able to. They came up. They go, oh, "We got AAA. We'll get AAA over here for you." And they really take care of this lady. Right. And I helped a little by the way kind of thing. I'm the guy that flagged these guys down. That you know, who knows how long she's been sitting there. And, and I just walked away, going, "Wow, I helped." Yeah, I wouldn't have happened if I didn't take that walk. Wow, I got to the yeah, man. And you just start feeling good about stuff. And once you start feeling good about your life, and you start feeling good about things that are happening. But a lot of us are taught we should be victims. A lot of us are taught because you're color or your sexual identity you're a victim so you can't be happy because you're a victim and we're going to show you so many examples of this happening negatively but we're not going to celebrate the times it didn't happen right we're not going to celebrate the times that people could just pass by each other two different races and didn't call each other names we're going to really 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 show you the time that one person had 15 seconds of a slip up and really showed their true colors we're just going to keep showing that 15 seconds over and over from different angles to really show you how bad that 15 seconds of life was so you know life is bad Oh, yeah, I got all the reason in the world to know life is bad. Look at that video, that guy freaking out. See, that stuff's happening. Yeah, but watch all those people that aren't freaking out. Right. Oh, they probably really think that way. If that's how you want to feel, then that's your reality. Right. But if you want to feel that people are inherently good and want the best for the world and want to see people succeed, if they know they can succeed too, if they know that me taking the pie doesn't affect their pie and everyone can help everyone, then you start feeling a little better. And again, that brings me back to seems like all that stuff is only possible in a simulated environment if you really could manifest and control things. And it seems like a simulated environment would be flat. And it seems like if there was a controlling group that maybe came to this simulation first mm -hmm. and they knew that to be the case, that they maybe would want to control that you, information. You mean they, they come to the, to the idea that hey, we are in a simulation? No, they, they just... I mean, just you know, they learned how to manipulate it. And generations didn't... have come to this plane of, of this realm that we're in. We're in a realm okay. that, that some people think is a ball called Earth or whatever. What if it's just a realm that you come to experience this, that, or the other? Well, you're 40 years old. Someone that's 75 years old came here 35 years before you. What if they came across this book and went, oh, shit, I got all the answers. Oh, man, I ain't going to tell you. I'm going to keep my secrets to myself. Well, that's like the secret societies. They found the answers, the knights templar and all that good stuff they got all the answers the illuminati or whatever and they they hide it to those right. that can find it or maybe because they don't want everyone knowing that they can control things because then the playground ain't as big if everyone knows they can go to the park you know what if that's the case so they start hiding all this stuff and you know it's it, it, well that, it's, that plays into to the component of greed because if you don't have something to reflect your success or reflect your skills or your abilities somebody to look down on there's less value so if we all have the same abilities we all understand the the uh, if we want to say ability or if you want to say technology or whatever it is right then then they lose value the people the the small percentage who maybe have that control or have that knowledge yeah they they become devalued because they don't want to be equalized which is right where, when you're higher you don't ever want to be the low end you don't if you're a starter on the team you don't want to ride the bench you know yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing but then by thinking that there is no higher and lower that everything is just what it is you know, but yeah, it just seems like the, the, all that stuff, the evil, the greed, the, you know, the, the, and that goes back into biblical stuff. Like Satan comes in and has himself in weird ways and you know, all this like seven deadly sins and stuff like that. It's like, what if all that stuff is real? Like, what if these weird things that we're just taught, like pride, one of the seven deadly sins and we got damn parades for it. Like, it's just like, I don't know how that works, but what if, and I think it was one of the Bilderbergs or whatever that said, or the Rothschilds that said everything that will have succeeded when everything you believe is right is wrong and everything that is wrong is right what if that's the case like what if we are being led into a, a society where 
we like, what's the image of Baphomet? The 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 goat headed dude with tits. Essentially, it's a uh-huh. masculine figure with feminine things, and it's goat headed. It's not nah, what if that represented a trans person and the whole thing was that a trans person this is where my favorite uh i've i'm the only one that i know that has made these connections uh in this theory um and i'm not putting any weight behind it to say it is true but you're just having the thought yeah uh have you seen the movie uh, south park bigger longer uncut mm-hmm I will we'll ignore the, the, the microchipping uh, element of that storyline, right. but let's just go to the storyline of Terrence and Philip. publicly executed was the case because they said messed up stuff on TV. Right. They didn't do anything wrong. The kids started doing stuff wrong. So the parents microchipped and stuff, but Terrence and Philip, the whole reason why Satan could come up when they died is because the blood of the innocent would hit the ground. They didn't do anything wrong. It's not their fault they're saying this stuff. It's not their fault that people are... are taking you know action that they aren't saying to take that's you're taking it upon yourself to now start swearing and, and acting inappropriate that's not they didn't do it they just said this stuff and put it out there it could be you know and that was kind of how that show is, is being portrayed this is the blood right. of the innocent hit the ground currently in our day and age we have someone in the public eye that people would gladly uh, like to see publicly executed because they're saying a lot of messed up stuff right they're not doing anything messed up. They've done a lot of good, actually, uh, in terms of inner city uh, funding and this and that, uh, pedophiles being arrested. But they've said a lot of messed up stuff, and their followers have started doing messed up stuff. Uh, but again, that's not their fault. Right. And that individual, uh, being the president of the United States, uh, if he's taken out, in a sense, maybe it's an impeachment, maybe it's an actual assassination, maybe it's just being voted out whatever, whatever if the blood of the innocent hits the ground maybe the antichrist can come up and what if just just for sake of argument right now with all the presidential candidates that we have on the democratic side people are like these people all suck none of these people could beat trump maybe bernie whatever what if someone had the option to say do we just want obama back and a lot of people claimed he was the Antichrist, this, that, whatever. What if, what if Barack, I don't want to be president again, but you know who had my back the whole time was Michelle. Mm. And what did Joan Rivers say about Michelle? Have you seen that clip? Yeah, where she's where she just getting out of a car. and Yeah, hey, we're we going to have our first gay Everybody president? knows she's a tranny. Obama's gay, Michelle's a tranny. There are a lot of internet videos that, that would lead you to believe that Michelle's a tranny. A lot of people openly would go, yeah, that's, that's a dude. Look at how big she is, this and that, whatever. What if, just what if, Michelle ran for president. I don't know if that's even possible or whatever, but what if she ran for president? But before she did, and this is what I thought the book Becoming Michelle Obama was about, and it might be, I haven't read it, and, but I would assume people have and, it, and they haven't talked about it yet. But I was You make me want to read it now. How, how, funny, you how, funny, of how funny would that book be if, if it really was Becoming Michelle Obama and it was all about a trans thing, but no one actually read <laughs> no it. No one actually read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I love her so much. And it's all about coming out. I put yeah. that book out years ago. You didn't know? <laughs> But but what if? <laughs> Holy shit! Now what, I got to read what, the book now. Right. What if? God what if they it. did come out and said before she runs, we have to tell you guys the honest truth that we obviously couldn't tell you in 2008 because it was a different time. But now, mm-hmm. because of Caitlyn Jenner and RuPaul's a major figure now, what because of all the acceptance, we can tell you that Michelle was not born a woman. What would the overall reaction for people, let's say 35 and under, or you know, would it be? Oh, or would it be fucking bravery? Most of the kids, most of the the voting population of the twenty ones and this and that. Oh my God, how brave! Also, at the same time, it would really, 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 really head fuck those people, the older generation, especially those uh, conservative Republican types that maybe made the comments of, yeah, you know, for a black chick, she's pretty hot. Right, you know what I mean. Those people that secretly want to take a black, you know, they that that racist element to them, but they're like, oh, 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 yeah, but hey, for a black chick, and how how much have we been told how beautiful and elegant Michelle Obama is? It's the only first lady who ever the most beautiful, most everything about it. What if it came out that that was a dude? <laughs> Everyone that said how beautiful she was that doesn't even uh, find trainees attractive would then go, oh my god, I've said a trainee is attractive. Now, uh, okay, maybe I have to accept. 
trannies in general and maybe 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 that tells me i'm messing my maybe i'm gay maybe i'm this and that and it creates this whole confusion and now you got this whole like civil war in a sense that would have happened with the gun owners and the the redneck you know type militant militia people that originally were the kind of people that would conquer a land and and found the country uh, now if they're trying to essentially defend themselves against a tyrannical uh, government they don't even have the comprehension to fight back that everything they're so fucking confused most men are being told they're wrong for being men. So it's just, it's just this whole confusion thing that all this chaos could come into it seeming like, well, that could be symptoms of Satan coming in. And what, what if, what if that's the case? What if Michelle Obama is, is the anti and Trump is the, or maybe it's not her. Maybe it's somebody else that represents that, but it is kind of interesting that Baphomet is a goat headed dude with tits. And one of the people that has the most traction that I even put it on Facebook as kind of a goof. Would you vote for her if you can't? Oh, fuck yeah. Hell yeah, yeah. The person that hands down would probably beat Trump. If she decided to run, hands goddamn down, Michelle Obama wins. Not only do we have our first female president, but she's also black. Oh, wait. And she's trans. Oh, my God. We're so progressive. Wow. How amazing are we? Now everyone's buying into something that's unnatural and unhealthy. You know, what if that's the case? I'm not saying being trans is unnatural and healthy, but what if that is the storyline? Right. What if we are being fed a gay agenda that that um, we're being taught? And what if it all comes down to something as simple as the British royalty or the British thing that we broke away from, we, we fought for our independence. What if the only way to beat America back into submission was programming, control, and putting things out on TV that would then confuse generations, get people fighting against each other, having, you know, black people feeling like victims, having, you know, white males feeling like they don't belong, having everyone else being told that they're the best and, you know, you're, but they're all victims, you know, and all this programming. And it's weird being in Hollywood. I worked on a lot of sets as a background or whatever, almost consistently behind the camera to some degree of power, the higher degrees of power, the people that are really calling the shots, it's a British dude. Almost unanimously, it's a British person that that's really calling the shots. It's really the, the person in charge. You know, and the most matter of fact, the it's like, I, you know, there's a lot of British influence in American cinema. Well, see now the normal conspiracy is like the Jews control Hollywood. So now your 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 suggestion well, is also, maybe it's the British. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm saying on, on the surface level, what if right. there, that, that was a thing while this other thing was happening or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the case, I don't know. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's all wonder. Um, Owen Benjamin, who's gotten a lot of flack from Hollywood and stuff, he talks about the small hats and the Jews all the time running stuff. I've, I've actually started listening to his podcast, not because I enjoy all the things that he says, because I... I I'm kind of adverse to his a lot of his takes. Some of the stuff is, but I like listening to it to understand. I'm trying to understand where he's coming from and stuff, yeah, and, I mean, and what it, happened to him and where. He from some of the people I've talked to, like Trez or whatever, they said that he when he left, he left by um, burning a lot of bridges and turning his back on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But he did it because he was starting to succumb to the Hollywood influence of having to do what it took to get to the next level, mm. and then he took shame in that. And went the exact opposite way, and his his waking up was a very violent one, according to Trez's exact words. That is, him waking up. I need to talk, he, I need to ask Trez about and that. He though. said he took a lot of people with him, but now he is where he is, which is the right place. But it just took a very rocky road to get there. Which, is he the right place? Though? It's hard not to take that side if you spend a lot of time. You just play through his video, and you realize this guy's putting hours out a day where he's being open about stuff people are talking about and he seems like he's living a good life and he's living on a farm where you're self-sustained and stuff I guess and like, I'm, I'm again, talking you know, more specifically about only because he's not in the Hollywood yeah. eye but he's living a life where he doesn't need anyone if, if you were to take into like we let's say we had a, a, a solar flare power grid fallout I think he's in a better position than you or I well I understand that I'm, I'm just talking about some of the stuff he says that's some big generalizations like when his reference to when he talks about black people he uses the term uh what was it called bike thieves or well, something yeah i mean again i don't i'm not backing up everything the guy says right you know what i mean but he talks mostly about and when he does talk about this stuff he's not i don't i don't hear him bashing or i hear him just saying that as a thing maybe to get shock value but he's coming from a point of 
hey, we should be able to have pride in your culture and pride in just because you're white, you shouldn't be not proud of being white because black people are proud of being black. And if they can do that, why can't we do this? And it's, you know, it just seems like, you, I, again, a lot of stances, I don't, I'm not riding his way very hard, but it, as I'm listening to him with, with a good amount of stuff, it's just like, it doesn't seem like he has a bad life right now. It seems like he has full control of his no, time. I, I think and he's money happy with his stuff. I, I just yeah. worry about some of the intent. Because everything he says, he sounds like he really believes. The intent doesn't seem malicious. It seems uh, it, 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 I'm not getting that vibe from him so much. It feels like someone that like he's very riding that religious wave of you know that. And again, I don't know. I'm not right. You know, I don't know what's right or wrong or same because I, I literally know. know anything other than maybe the ten episodes of this podcast that I've listened to. Yeah, but he he really seems very know, but... informed on a lot of stuff, you know. But then I, I watch these so other did, guys that, that make just... fun of him all the time, and they're like, "Oh, and off his rocker again. Here he is crying about something." And you're like, "All right." <laughs> the the only thing I add to that is I just recently saw a, a video of when he was on Joey Diaz's podcast. Again, I guess that was some time ago. Yeah, and he in that podcast he seemed a lot more. Maybe meek is not the right word, but a little more humbled, a little more contained. Of course, he was on. He was doing a lot of fucking weed too. I think he got like yeah, two hundred milligram star of death or whatever. Yeah, yeah. so that yeah. that could have had something. That, to do that's, with it too. that was the original thing. They said he he was broken. The weed broke him. Was that they thought? He, oh, really? There he was. He took that weed. Then he went and lived in the woods. You know, weed really messed up on uh, Benjamin. But that that again, I would love to to have a conversation with him though. I would yeah, love to talk to him. Um, yeah, I, I've it's it's interesting. Like and again. Another person that he, uh, being conspiracy wise, people would talk about flat Earth and stuff, and you can watch his progression into it where he went, hmm, can't prove to me this is a ball. He and he had David Weiss on his podcast, a very long, drawn out conversation. Where oh, that's why I've heard his name before. Yeah, okay. where he's he's had he's had him on there, and and someone that coming to the understanding of wow, as you question stuff, yeah, the moon landing doesn't seem like it was the way we're told. And another interesting thing with um. Going back to the heliocentric model versus the the flat Earth accepted model, if we accept it's the heliocentric model, and we accept that there's a ball of matter, magma, core, man, all that stuff that formed, created a ball that has a northern pole that's magnetic and an axis that goes through the middle that this thing spins perfectly on. It's directly in the middle to a southern pole. That doesn't have any effect on your compass or whatever the case is. Can you find an example of that anywhere on this planet? Is there like a field we can go to where you go, hey, all those little rocks over there, they're perfectly round. They got to access this through them and they got a center. It's, it's a small version of Earth, actually. There's no smaller model that you can create of what we're told Earth is. Right. There's not a, a, they haven't recreated it in a lab. Look at this fucking thing we got floating here. It's got an axis that's got a northern magnetic polarity and a southern polarity. Uh, but what the flat earthers say that we're on, this essentially the electromagnetic realm of sort, that the northern polarity would be the center and the outer rim would be the southern, uh, uh, the negative polarity or whatever. It's like a speaker magnet. You can recreate that. You got the northern magnet, the magnetic in the center, and the outer is this and that, and like all these things. Go, you can recreate what they're saying here. But you can't recreate this this other thing that, that they're saying that Earth is, which is kind of fascinating to me that we, and then going to that point, a compass, mm. right? Now let's say you're in Australia. That compass is working for you. A little tiny little arrow on there. It's pointing to the north. Okay, well, how much curvature is that going around? That compass is able to pick that up from the southern hemisphere? All right, wouldn't that maybe be easier on a flat surface? I don't know. I don't know if magnetic things have been. But then I go, well, now let's say you're Australia. And like you said before, the older models of the globe were shown where the U.S. is big and in the center. Generally, country pride, if you had control of making the map, you'd make yourself the biggest in the center. Well, if space has no up or down, no top or bottom, none of that. It's all just empty, vast, whatever. Why would the North Pole have to be on top? Just because we accept North to be up, top, whatever. Why would you in Australia have to draw the model of North being your top? Why couldn't you draw yourself as the front and center of the globe 
And you go, yeah, we're the top. You guys are the bottom, bitch. Like, what, the way we draw you, right. we got a we got a top ice cap and the magnets on the bottom. Right. We're going to draw it this way. And you go back to the UN logo, being one of those things that has it all from the center out, which kind of dictates that that's the bottom. And then again, that'd be the flat earth map. And you're like, God damn it. It all comes back to the damn <laughs> flat earth map. And it, that working out better for flight patterns, that working out better for long distance shooting, that working out better for this, that, or whatever. And it, it really breaks down the, damn, man, I don't want things to be leaning that heavily towards that side because we were taught so long that it's stupid. But if you actually look into it, it's really hard to find any evidence. And by that, I mean, I've seen zero examples of people actually being able to prove this is a ball. And they go, ah, there's pictures from space. And those are altered. Those are edited. Again, the picture in the, the iPhone, you can find the repeated cloud imagery. And that's one that people really think is a real picture. We had one picture of Earth for like 30 some years. And it was some weird ass angle of Antarctica, they were saying. It, what that's all we have and then the, the other pictures we have are so inconsistent with each other right. land masses change it looks like a fisheye lens it looks like a painting it looks fake and you go uh, we, so we don't have actual evidence visibly oh have you ever flown in a plane i got a picture in my phone from when i flew from peru to here right over the water ruler flat all right, from a plane, you can't see the Neil deGrasse Tyson comes out and goes, oh, 30,000 feet isn't high enough. Because mm. people with weather balloons are sending 100,000 feet. Still no curvature. None. But when Felix Baumgartner jumped from the uh, air balloon that was 100,000 right. feet or whatever, tons of curvature. But he's only over one state. He's just over, like, Utah. And it's so much curvature. So people have taken, like, the actual globe we're shown as a picture of space. With Felix's thing and right, how it's much more curvature, curvature than you could actually. It takes the most like a good quarter of the Earth. Right, you know, you go at that curve extremity. It, it's impossible that it's that. So it's obviously altered. Obviously altered. Again, if they're altering this stuff, at what point do things curve? And you know, it, it, it's just there's no evidence that would suggest that it is the heliocentric model. It seems like the heliocentric model was created to control. So most people just don't think that they have an option, don't think they can travel to this place or that place, can't do anything, so they just give up and let's just live my life through someone else on TV. And then through there, they're being programmed that they're a it's victim. Easier path. Yeah, path of least resistance, and you're a victim, and everything happens, you're, you're entitled to something that you'll never get, so don't even try for it, and whatever the case. So people just, I'll just live my life through that guy's life. I'm not ready to jump on board. I am going to make a, a conscious effort if you find to, anything, let to, me know. to look at stuff. Yeah, if you find something that that's a clear-cut thing, go, mocked. dude, you missed this. Send it to me. You got my Facebook. Right. If you find something, you're like, oh, this is all I needed to see to know that it's bullshit, by yeah. all means. But I haven't found that one thing. And and all that being said, and something I just covered in the, in the 9-11 episode, is the, the f and it was me talking about my progression from believing the official story to not, was that that point where you have to, at one point, you'll have to face that fear of accepting that everything, your worldview is, is wrong. Yeah. Well, and that's terrifying. It was terrifying to me at the time, and it took a long time for me to get through that. And anybody else, I just. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it can be terrifying, but also, like, it's a trained thing. Like, for me, when I started my weed delivery business, it was really weird um, not having someone to turn to to get permission for something not having somewhere i needed to be at a certain time oh you got to be here at nine until five you got this and that and i it was a kind of like a little um system shock to be able to go i have complete control so my time frame is different than your time frame and i i started doing stuff that i was like well i'm just gonna live my life the way i want to live my life i i, I mean like the point where i was just I always had a 12 pack of Stella and I was always <laughs> drinking beer. If I was delivering beer at 11 in the morning, I was, if I was delivering weed, I was drinking beer on the way there. And it was, I just started calling my own shots, man. This is, right. a, this is a game. I'm going to live it the way I want to live it. And, and no one can tell me nothing. And everything's worked out. You know, everything worked out the way it needed to, to get me where, you know, all these little experiences of whatever. And I'm like, man, like I, I never really seen myself making it in comedy until my late thirties or forties. Anyways, like, most of the people that I looked up to made it in their 40s. Then other household names, all the podcasts everyone knows, are 40-some years old before they got picked up. You know, very few people are in their 30s or earlier 
that become household names that last a while or whatever. So I've always kind of seen like, all right, 10 years, still good. Well, my 10 year mark will be good towards my, in my thirties. And then in that 10 year span after that, then I'm, you know, I'll have something to say in my 40, you know, and everything is lining up to where I'm like, all right, everything works out. And, you know, it, that's just the thing that I think we have to take away is just the little thing of, are you a have to person or are you a get to person? Uh, I have to go to work today or, Hey, I get to go to work today because I got a job and I, it's going to pay me. I get to do that. Hell yeah. And you change your little attitudes and, about things and you, the person that annoyed you at work then all of a sudden gets moved to a different office and you don't know why, but now all of a sudden it works more pleasant because you started enjoying it and you had no control over this, that, or whatever. But all the things in the universe that have to partake for something to line up, like how crazy is it uh, that the time frame that things will happen like by a half second one way or the other and this is kind of one of those things that i it gets to a point where a lot of people will kind of back me up and go hey man no no, no that's that's not the case you don't have to think that way you know that, that it's not true right uh when i talk about my dad dying my dad died when i was 15 months old and uh essentially if not for being a only child with a single mom that it would just kind of had that yearning for wanting to be heard i might have never done comedy it, everything that happened for me to be able to do long distance drives and stuff all happened because i was kind of a loner as a kid and all that hmm. stuff had to have happened because my dad died and I, you know it's just it happened that way and that's how i became what i was so maybe my goal before i came to this earth was to do what i'm doing now and maybe the only way to get me to do that and to have enough character and enough drive and enough fearlessness of death knowing that it's going to happen to so just live your life or whatever maybe all that stuff had to happen and my dad had to die and all this whatever stuff so maybe maybe that's the case i don't know if we're here on a programmed simulation and uh an interesting thing is that he died because of a head-on collision with a semi-truck that only could have happened at this given moment because there was a snow plow blowing snow into the road semi-truck came in their lane hit him head-on that truck was already on its course from it's leaving or picking up this, this it was on its course that's an employed situation right snowplow already on its course it's doing its thing it's going to do that thing on that path no matter what the factor was my dad's car my mom was in the car uh my uncle was in the car i was supposed to be in the car they decided last minute hey let's go drop the kid off at the mom's house and we're gonna go watch the ice capades or whatever the case was so they dropped me off at my grandma's house and uh, give your mom a hug goodbye. And I was running around avoiding her. No, 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 no. Well, at least give your dad a hug goodbye. And I finally did. But enough time had passed. Me running around. That was kind of making them late, whatever. So them leaving the house when they did. It's kind of my fault, in a sense. In a sense of like, it was me that made them leave. Had I not run around and ran away from my mom. Had I just given her a hug when I needed to. Give my dad a hug when I needed to. That had been... 30 seconds further in advance, that truck and that snowplow might have not have passed at the same time. You don't, you don't, have, you don't allow yourself to carry guilt. Again, again, I already prefaced by saying people will back me up saying you don't okay. feel this. Again, no, I don't. Because okay. I feel like things happen for a reason. Right. I feel like everything had to have happened that way for me to be who I am now and be the path I am now. Okay, I got you. I couldn't control sense. it happening that way. And since there's no way I, I knew that was going to happen as a kid. It's not like I'm bearing like, oh, I killed my dad kind of in a sense technically right. uh, technically i'm the reason they left when they left you know but no i don't i don't bear guilt from that but i look at it like it almost feels inevitable that it happened the way it happened to get me where i'm at or to get the experience that maybe i wanted to have maybe my dad only had an experience of wanting to produce something that did something and maybe he only lived the life he needed to live for me to go on and do what i needed to do i don't have any guilt or but it had to have happened that way for me to have the ability to do what i'm doing now and it seems inevitable, but it also seems like it, it's all for a purpose, you know, whatever the reason. But but think of all the stuff that has to happen in your day to day life for something to line up perfectly. Like the universe is working right now to bring you what you want in a way that maybe someone in another state just got uh, an email that he got a job promotion. He's like, hell yeah, I'm gonna go buy a new car, and then he buys a new car, drives it down, and. Maybe he inspires someone that goes, dude, that car is sweet. I want to become a guy that works on this, that, or the other. And then that guy inspires you in some roundabout way, or you see him, or he helps you because he's got the money because of this business he started because of this guy that got a job over here. All this weird stuff that had to have happened for the one person to cross paths with the other person. Like, And it all seems inevitable. So it goes back to your point of maybe this is all a program thing that you didn't have any choice of. We have a little bit of free will in there to 
do whatever, but is it free will if you only know what you know because you heard it from someone else? You know, is it free will if you, you know, if the information was kind of given to you that way, you know, or, you know, should you be thankful for the fact that you're on a ride? It's just a ride. And yeah. there's going to be these scary things. There's going to be things that you don't understand. You don't need to know how the operator is doing it because it's just a ride. Just have some fun with it. While you're here and it's just a ride, enjoy it. And that Bill Hicks thing was one of the first things that really got me opened up to the eyes of, all right, man, yeah, let me just enjoy the ride for whatever it is, for the scary stuff, for the bad stuff. It's always trying to find the best in it. And, you know, well, if that happened, there's got to be a reason for it. If that happened, happened for whatever reason. I might not know the reason right now, but maybe in the future I'll see the reason. As a kid, if I would have tried taking on the, that thought process of, oh, my God, my dad died because of me, maybe it would have been too heavy and I wouldn't have done with it. But now I go, I can only be who I am now. I can only accept all the alone time I've had on the road now because I had that when I was younger. Right. Because I was born and raised the way I was, which was no fault of anyone else's, but it seems inevitable that it happened that way. And maybe the fact that I was the one that was delaying them or whatever had to happen so it would wake me up in the future to go, oh, wow. I was a contributing factor, but I didn't know I was. So I have no guilt for it as being a kid. I didn't know what I was, you know, as innocent as it was. It's inevitable, but it had to happen. Hmm. You know, it's just kind of weird that way that we don't know, you know. Do you, we're, we're getting called in a long time, so I got to bring it to a close here eventually, but. Okay, yeah. Right. Um, do you not, do you, is that how you live your life? Is like, is, is everything is destined to be that. I, I just try to live worry-free. Like my, my weed delivery business was called worry-free delivery. <laughs> okay. It was called no worries deliveries. Uh, I call it no worries deliveries. And then my comedy brand was called no worries comedy until i realized that well i'm not living by example on that because no is a negative word mm. and focusing on no worries is kind of negative if you change that to worry free it kind of feels better it's a positive word it, worry it, free if you're free of worry and said no no worry you know no 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 you know right but it's just that little change so worry free is kind of how i like to live and i just don't worry about stuff like i just know things are going to work out you know I have an undecided point of view, and I lean two different ways, and two different times of thoughts, and depending on what time of day you ask me, is uh, I don't. I, I wish I could accept the idea that everything is 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 a destined, or there's certain things that we can't try, or we can't deal with, or worry about, or or like Hicks said, it's all a ride. But then I also I'm pulled the other way where I feel like there's a sense of duty within humanity that uh you know for to to pay the the cost of admission to to have a life is to also work towards preparing the world for the next generation to come i don't know and why then, that's it, our responsibility that's a heavy responsibility to have to go we got to fix the future how do we know it's not i it's not I, I get what you're yet, saying but, but i also they don't know any different you know they, when they're born into it they accept it for what it is and yeah. They, they don't they don't know what's bad unless you tell them it's bad you know kids don't know racism a thing until you tell kids that racism was that, that slavery was a thing like you know i witnessed that happening in north carolina like just kids being told they should fear other people you know just by the way kind of stuff but just reminding kids that slavery was a thing keeps that that oh man really you know, that kind of tension alive in that in that perspective i get but this is like the only thing that even keeps me because I'm so disillusioned, jaded, and, and just, I don't believe the whole idea of, of like U.S. politics or something. But the only reason I even pay attention or follow it, because I feel like I have a responsibility to at least monitor where we're going as a society from, the, yeah. you throw out the window if you think it's real or not, because I, you know, I, I lean both ways, you know. It doesn't seem like that stuff has a lot of, at, but I've, 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 but again, I still, I still reach that duty. It's like, you know what, I've, I've uh, for the most part, I've enjoyed my life for better or for worse. You know, and then the condition of the world that I leave is going to be what the person who's yet to be born, what they're going to experience. And yeah, but that's if we allow kind of damage a... to happen or we don't do anything to, to maintain it or at least a, a, an acceptable status, right. whatever you want to define that as. That's kind of an arrogant thing that you go, the world that I leave, because everyone has a part in it. You're not that's what I'm person. saying. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, so duty is, if, is if us as a collective. You, if all you can do, but you can't control the collective. If all you can do is the best for your world, and you make sure you clean up your mess, and you make sure that if you see something right in your path, you go, "Hey, I can, I can, I can fight, defend someone if they're right there, 
Right. But I'm not going to go out of my way to keep trying to find someone to defend. I'm not going to go out of my way to find the kids that are dying. I'm not going to go out of my way to find that stuff. But if it presents itself right in front of me, I know how to emotionally control myself to be able to help, maybe help people in the scenario. Or I know how to emotionally control myself to realize, like, okay, well, I'll defend that person now because it's right here and I feel that's the right thing to do. But I'm not going to keep looking for that because that's all you're going to find and you're not actually going to have time to enjoy life for what it is if you're always trying to fight. And that's one of the uh, things that and this is kind of a weird segue into this, but the, the backwards flag on the military suits, uh, there's, I know the answer for it because I've talked to Marines about it and stuff. They go, it represents the flag pole. It's on your right side, so it represents the flag as it would be if you're running into battle. Right. It's flying backwards. You're running into battle. Because you'd be looking at it from the other side. I don't like the idea that we always have to represent our country running into battle. Mm. I don't necessarily like that that's the thing. But also, that's not 100% consistent because there are some people that have it on the front of their uniforms backwards. Pasco County Police, we watch Live PD, being one of them, I watch a lot of Live PD, they have it on the front of their... They're police officers first off. They're not military people running into battle. Right. They're police officers, and they have it backwards on the front of their shirt. I, why? And on the side of their cars. And on the side of their cars, exactly. But the yeah. side of the car could be the argument of the flying oh, yeah, battle. Yeah, yeah, right, but right. the front is the interesting thing because now it doesn't represent that. Now it doesn't represent you know the, the flying into battle. It's something different. So is there a sub-government that's represented by the backwards flag that we don't know that some people are defending and some people aren't? Maybe there is a shadow government and that's how they represent. I don't know. That could be a thing that we just are told one way or the other. But back to the whole accepted reason as to why the Marines have it there. I was running into battle and I go, I don't, I don't agree that we should always be represented trying to fight a war. Right. You know, and like, I think it was like Bill Burr or something like that, that I don't remember who, but they're talking about like presidential, um, they always talk about uh, get rid of unemployment. We want to, zero unemployment, have everyone working. He's like, shouldn't the goal of a modern society be nobody working? <laughs> yeah, 100% unemployment. Like, we just have a selfish, sufficient thing and we just all it's just chill. But like, um, we don't think that way because we just were programmed in the, in the thing. And you go again, who's running the programming when it comes to all that? And you go, oh, people created a college system. They created a public education system that they didn't send their own kids to, that they sent us to, to get this just brainwashed, fed in. We know what the middle of the earth is. We know this because we can't teach wonder. If we told you we've only been eight miles, then... Oh, Oh, that's, it, it would it would be nothing but wonder. What the fuck is in the middle? I don't want you to step what, by the, what you just said about what about is in the middle. You can't teach wonder. That's such yeah. a uh, such a brilliant point. Yeah, and and they'll never like. But here's wonder. The thing. Something's got to be killed. You, you you have wonder, and you you have to lose it. You have to lose the I, the sense of adventure, the wonder. Yeah, the, as a kid, the I, desire to go out and expand your territory. All the things I, that we were talking about. I had beginning. that on mushrooms. I, I realized that I didn't wonder enough, and I was like, "But I'm wondering about not wondering. Oh my god, I'm wondering. Hey, wonder's a thing." <laughs> But I realized like wonder wasn't a thing as, as prominent as it should be. You're not taught to wonder. You're not taught to, you know, we were taught we have the answer. Someone above you has the answer. There's always someone above the person that's above the person that has the answer. There's, there's, no there's always authority. Yeah, yeah. And you can't teach that. But again, going back to just digging into the core, if we've been eight miles, you can't, I, I'm not going to believe you if you told me you know what's at mile 10. If there's right. one mile of rock between you and the thing you're trying to tell me is there, but you have never penetrated that one mile of rock to tell me for sure that's there, I can't believe you. Even less likely at five miles of rock and molten metal and stuff. Now we're dealing with 10 miles. That's a lot of miles. Rock and molten and metal or whatever it could be. Now you're dealing with 100 miles. But the distance is 30 992 miles that we've accepted we don't actually know the distance from here to the center of the earth we, but we think we know but eight miles they've dug 3900 miles that we just go ah they must know they right. got they got lab coats and stuff right like they there's guys that that would that they would know it There'd have to be thousands of scientists involved in this conspiracy if they didn't. And you go, no, they don't have access to that information. There's only a few people that have access to that, and most people are just basing off what they've already been told. So they're going, okay, we're starting with the thing that it's a ball, so we're going from there. Well, it doesn't always, like, like cell phones don't bounce off satellites. They bounce off ground-related information. There's fiber optics going through the ocean sending information, not satellites sending one thing or the other. There's 
actual weather there's balloons with these satellite things attached to them that have crashed in like Africa and stuff that people have video of. It looks just like what we accept a satellite look like, but it's attached to a giant fucking balloon. And then Google goes, yeah, we got these balloon things up in the sky that we use for communication. It, it's all terrestrial. It's not actually getting out of low Earth orbit, if that's even a thing. And, you know, but all we know of space is movies. Just like that new movie that came out, that Ad Astra or whatever it just came out. And then the new space movie. It's all this really, really high def. Oh my God, look at Look at how they move in space. And if Hollywood has that kind of a budget to make that movie look dope, what kind of a budget does NASA have? Right. How dope could they do it? It seems like they got a pretty big budget. So we go, we believe NASA. Oh, that company that was started by Nazis? Okay. Just saying. All right. The Nazis were bad at one point, and then they came to this plot of land, and all of a sudden they're good and got everyone's best interest at play. Oh, if there's okay. one thing Nazis were good at, that was controlling uh, the thoughts of their people. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of live in a world where that's kind of the thing. You're ashamed if you don't believe a certain thing. And it's it's really interesting. And, again, I only use that term. It's interesting. I don't know what it is other than interesting. I could be completely wrong, and that stuff is still interesting. Yeah. That's kind of like me with my, my margin of error. I, I can't, if I can't prove it to you, if I, I haven't yeah. done the research myself, I can only tell you that this is the way I lean. Yeah, I could be is, wrong though. You know? just, uh, based off the evidence, it seems like a lot of this stuff has more weight than it should, and that can go for any conspiracy theory, like like the school shootings and stuff. You go based off the evidence that they usually have a drill before something like this happens. They usually can't catch the they kill the guy without anything. It's usually cops just standing around doing whatever. There's usually people that seem like crisis actors. All this stuff seems to be the case consistently. It's really hard to think that it's genuine. If it seems like it's an emotional heart plucking thing or whatever, you know, like I don't know, you know, but like I said, I go back to the thing where people go, Yo, things they lie about kids dying. Well, wouldn't it be better if they were lying? Right. <laughs> Why would that be a bad thing? Right. The parents wouldn't lie, parents wouldn't lie, and you go, That's an emotional heartstring you're plucking. Mm -hmm. That's you using emotion instead of logic. What if they did lie? Would that be so bad? Do you think it's that hard for people with all kinds of power and budget to get 10 people to tell a fib to a bunch of people they don't know? They can probably get those people to do it. You know, like, there's probably people they can get, hey, you know what? We don't have to threaten you. We've got unlimited islands. If you just go that way, we'll give you a whole island that we built everything you need on, self-sustaining. You just go there when you're all done. We'll reward you for doing this. Fuck yeah, your family will be taken care of forever. Fuck yeah. There's people that do it for all that reason. You know, you don't know why someone's willing to lie or when they go, well, there's no crisis actors. What if those people didn't know that they were in crisis actors? What if they just thought they were just trying to do a drill? Hey, we're going to do a, a mass shooting drill. We're filming it just for education purposes. And then a week later, those people see that shit on TV and go, oh, fuck. Right. And people have already come to their door going, you don't say a goddamn word. That could happen. Right. It's not out of the realm of possibility that people did things feeling like they're doing the right thing and then were threatened later. It doesn't mean that they had signed up going, oh, fuck it, I want to be a crisis actor, lying to everybody. They didn't well, have the to same do reason, reason you can convince somebody to go to war and shoot some brown yeah. person they've never met is a sense of duty. Yeah. So well, what can you... I that, agree with you. It's 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 not that, too hard for me to believe that they can convince somebody that to Marine do something that I out told of the you sense I of met, duty. He claims that the Boston bombing... That one of the guys that was seen with uh, um, one of the, the the guys in the khaki pants, those guys. I think so. He, yeah, there was a goes, group of guys dressed similar. He knew similar. one of them. He goes, I. He goes, they they froze frame one of the pictures and they they hung in their office. They go, holy shit, we that guy was in our, our squad or whatever. Oh my god, so and so or an asshole. He bought into that side. Oh man, he's doing that job. Like and he's like, yeah, we weren't happy when we seen him doing that, but. One of the guys we worked with is on the other you side. Ever run into that Marine again? Please tell him I want to talk to him. I, I've tried to get him on Trez's podcast. Um, oh, so you know he's still in yeah, the Yeah, he, oh, okay. he just sent me something on Facebook the other day, but an attachment was unavailable. But um, he never made it out to my comedy show yesterday. He was going to come out to it. We keep in touch every now and then, but I'm connected on Facebook with him. But I tried to get him to Trez's podcast. He never showed up. So if he wants to be on record saying this stuff, I don't know or not, but right. he definitely was excited to talk. Whatever your name is, listen to this episode. Please make sure you listen to this episode. 
come talk to me. I'll try I'm to get him on something because he, he had like, plan to go to Vegas soon anyway. So I'll go he was the out. confident one in a lot of that stuff, talking about like the the Vegas shooting. The the, the only way that you, the only people that could have been shot in the crowd were the perimeter. And he was like the room that they said the paddock's room. He said that was a perimeter pickup. He was that was to keep people in. Everyone else was killed by people on the ground. And people in the crowd shooting at people. And I've met people in Vegas. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there were shootings happening a couple of casinos over. People were like, there's shootings happening here. Well, there's supposedly only one shooter shooting into one burger crowd. Why are people in this casino down the strip going, oh, my God, we have a shooter in the building. Right. What? There was a lot of chaos that day. I'm super sketched out about that. The, yeah. That and all the way back to we all the the things we don't know about the shooter himself. Yeah, it's just, just too much just... Just too much mystery. And then it just all goes away. But... Yeah, man, it's, it's, that's where I, where I said that's where flat earth to me just goes into the simulation, controlling your own life, and it's, it's even bigger to me than just a stupid little frisbee flying through space that people think it is. It's like it could be connected to so much more, and all that stuff ties into it by going, they're controlling emotion. If they know that emotion is key and it's all how you feel, and they put something out like 9-11 that creates fear, now they have a lot of people doing this kind of I, I can't deny it because that's, those are same arguments I've made about nine eleven. Yeah, so it's like it's, it's, it's almost like um like a, like a spell. The more energy you have into this, the more that they can control. And if they have everyone on this one thing, then it's more power towards them or whatever. And who knows? You know, it's it's like the power of prayer. If you get a lot of people thinking positively, and someone pulls through something, you go, "That's cool," but it could happen negatively. You know, we. We don't know, right? And we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> give me, give me your your last last thought. Then here, There's a couple more minutes left here. Um, about what? I don't know. <laughs> what, it, go go back to what I thought. I don't know if we talked about it on the recording or before the recording, but uh, uh, dealing with the uh, the outside pressure of people wanting you to conform to to general ideas. I don't. Do you deal with that? Do you let does that bother you? Where, I, where, I don't how do you really deal experience with that? that. I, I've kind of learned how to navigate those conversations. To where I, I don't. I don't know because I know it's effect. You know, like me, I can tell you for a fact. It, I've had people tell. I had bookers tell me. Uh, you're, you some of the things you say. Uh, I mean, makes this question want to use you. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm sure that a lot of people. Uh, there are people that think I'm a certain way because of Facebook posts, or they think I'm. You know, and again, I, I don't pick a side politically, but. Uh, I think Trump was the better option for a few different reasons, uh, mostly because he's a WWE Hall of Famer. But um, <laughs> because of my stance on a lot of things, people will think I'm completely right, right leaning. You know, like, oh, you're this right wing guy. That's this and that. And it's like, no, I just don't. I don't. I'm not buying into the um, witch hunt element that people have. This whole pitchfork, you know, mass up. Not even knowing why we're yelling at the guy, but we're yelling at the guy kind of thing. Exactly. And to hear people talking about stuff that in an emotional uh, way where they emotionally talking about it. I don't think that that's good. And I think that people are um, kind of letting that run their life where they see more evidence of that. And if they want to do that, then hey, that's cool, man. Uh, there's enough to go around where you don't have to do that. And I kind of want to use you as motivation. Not to, you know, mm. I just kind of don't let it bother me. I, I don't let that's where I've people gotten that, that, that want to be, you know, whatever, like, yeah, it, it lose a few friends because they get a wrong impression of whatever. But like, I don't know. I I feel like my intent is well meaning, and I know my intent more than you know my intent. I know right. my intent more than the next person knows my intent. Which is my argument with the Roseanne thing, which is a whole other conversation. But she came out and said what her intent was behind the tweet, and everyone else said, "No, that wasn't your intent." Your intent was to hurt. Your intent was racism. Your intent was to hold down in a whole race of people and you're going to lose everything for it. And she went, that's not my intent. My intent wasn't even based off her looks. My intent was based off her policies. And I can tell you how that was the thing. And she went on Rogan and broke down how yeah. she can, how she related the Planet of the Apes without even being racial. She said, it's her policy. It's a policy from this movie. One thing I loved. And people are like, oh, she's just making excuses now. You're telling her what her intent is? I don't think that's right. I don't think someone can, can tell you your intent. So I've just lived to know that I know my intent. I know I can only control me, and I know that my intent is well-meaning. Sometimes I make mistakes, and I'm misjudging. Sometimes I act in a way that might come across as disrespectful from a person if I watch it from there. And I go, okay, I've learned from that. I'm not going to shame myself or fault myself. I'm just going to try to learn and be better tomorrow. I, you know, make today the worst, the best of today is the worst of tomorrow is that kind of thing. Like, you know, 
leave the world a better place than you came, you know, but just trying to do the best that way and knowing that there's hiccups along the way, but you know, I don't know. It's, everyone's got their own path, you know, right. and you can't get good views without having a rocky terrain to get up. You know, you can't get to the top of the mountain without a struggle. And, you know, a lot of my struggle, you know, it's fitting for where I'm at in comedy, which is, it is some uphill battles. That I'm like, okay, well, while I'm fighting this, it's got to make me stronger over here. Or if I can still move forward while some people have this opinion of me, in the future, when I get the right forum, maybe they'll hear my actual intent and they'll go, oh, that guy wasn't such an asshole. Right. And there's always a chance for forgiveness. You always got a chance for whatever. And if people don't want to hear you out, then fuck them. If they want to have that closed-minded, that's what you meant. All right, man. Then you must have some pretty rugged stuff going on in your life you don't want to look at. So I, I ain't going to really try to bother with that. Like, you know, I hope you get your stuff worked out. You know, I hope right. everything goes better for you. You know, I, I wish you well, you know, right. kind of thing. Good luck with that. Yeah, but I'm, and I'm not doing it in, um, in a sarcastic tone either. Like, I really do want people to do well, you know. Me too. But, you know, if people want to have a certain opinion, then that is what I, it can't, is. I can't stop that, you know. Dude, great conversation. Great, great ending thought. And I hope people, uh, if they don't agree with any, everything you say, yeah, I hope they at least take that from you. They and don't like, have to agree with everything don't be, you say. But don't be scared to have a thought. Show me show me things that, you know, and I'm all about people going, hey, man, you missed this. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to argue with nobody about any of the points. I just go, I've had a lot of free time to look at a lot of the stuff. And if you can show me where I'm wrong or where you think something else, I'm down to hear you. But where I'm at right now, after all the mushrooms I've done and everything, <laughs> it really does feel like some kind of a weird-ass simulation that we don't know all the answers to, and there's some kind of a higher intelligent thing out there. And It's, it, if it's the getting to the point that it makes that, the most sense to me. Yeah, it, it really does. If the case is that you can control your own existence, why would that be a bad thing? And some people go, well, that means that I have to accept the past, and the past wasn't perfect, and if I was in control of that, ugh, that's an ugly mess. Mm. You go, yeah, we don't have to. That You can start from now. And move forward. You don't have to identify as the past. You don't have to identify as the future that hasn't happened yet. Oh, I'll never make it. You, that's done and over with. And most people have short memories and they don't give a shit. And as long as you're well-intended and well-meaning, like people will forgive. And you'll have new people that come into your life and go, oh, dude, I can support you way better than those people you thought were your best friends. And now you got these new people. And more stuff will happen if you can only swim across the pool by letting go of the edge. You know what I mean? Like. Right. It, so you got to let go of the past and all that stuff. And if people say, well, if I controlled this, then I had all these problems. Yeah, maybe you did that for a reason to be able to help people with those same problems. Maybe if you were, oh, so I controlled being raped. Maybe if you weren't raped, you wouldn't be able to help that person who's going to be a bigger voice than you could ever be because they have more confidence in themselves. And maybe you helped that person with your story and they went on to help 15 people. Isn't that a good thing? Right. Isn't that better than you not doing anything? Yeah. You can be so selfish to say your experiences are that, but it, it, not to say that you can to celebrate those negative things, but there's something positive can come out of anything if you want to look at it from, you know, enough time has passed or whatever, but you can rant on that all day long. But I think yeah. we have a lot more power than we're told we do. I agree. Thank you for, for having the conversation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>